I remember a time when the word free always had positive connotations. Free food, free drink, the city of Paris is free of the Bourbonite menace, and if you followed the signs for free candy, it usually resulted in making many interesting new friends in the back of an unmarked van. But not anymore! Now I regard the word free with immediate suspicion, yet another word ruined by the world of video games, alongside other once perfectly good words like connect and virtual and Molyneux. Let It Die kicks off with a skateboarding Grim Reaper wearing funky sunglasses, which is an image that leaps straight off the front cover of the complete dullard's guide to creativity. See, it's a traditionally grim thing, acting in a lively and light-hearted way. That's almost as clever as putting a hat on a dog. Shit on a midshipman's biscuit, a dog in a hat? Dogs don't wear hats! I hope the government are keeping a watchful eye on this dangerous subversive. You see, after my best character died and I had no continues, I needed to pay in-game money to resurrect him instead. For you see, permadeath is only a thing that poor people have to worry about. But to make that money, I had to grind with my second best avatar, but his stats were lower and I got him killed as well. So I had to grind up with my third best to bring him back so I could continue grinding up to bring my best one back. And that's when I knew I had to get out. Before I got caught in an inescapable vortex of failure. I learned that lesson from the Hillary Clinton campaign. So now that we've finally hauled ourselves out of the Christmas period and the usual quagmire of familial tension where all the chocolates exist in some strange dimension out of phase with the rest of the universe because everyone's too polite to start eating them, let's now immediately remind ourselves of it by playing Dead Rising 4, aka the Dead Rising Holiday Special. Hey, let's make Dead Rising 4 a Christmas game, some bold visionary must have said. That way everyone will be playing it through a haze of food coma and Bailey's Irish cream and won't notice it for the pile of steaming reindeer nuggets that it is. I shouldn't have to explain that the time limit were there to add a unique challenge. Yes, it could occasionally get in the way of trying on hilarious barbecue aprons and tricycling down the escalator, but isn't that cathartic fun all the more satisfying when we know we've parceled our time to allow for a quick barbecue apron session in between making progress and aren't just cocking about? I got through the entirety of Dead Rising 4 without dying once, and while I'd love to attribute that to my finely honed thumb and finger skills that are why they now know me downtown as Yahtzee Croshaw the weapon of masturbation, I think it's more to do with the fact that this game is mostly cocking about. Now, doing nothing but comparing Dead Rising 4 to its predecessors would be a stubborn, churlish, and counterproductive thing to do, so let's keep doing it. Time for a great big ending spoiler, so if you're waiting for Dead Rising 4 to inevitably stop being Expo exclusive so you could at least ruin next Christmas with it, then this might be the point to stop viewing. Frank West dies at the end. Yes, that lovable original Dead Rising protagonist, so popular they had to do a version of Dead Rising 2 with him literally patched in to replace the other dude, who was even in Marvel vs. Capcom once, which was a little bit weird but nonetheless fun, this game features his canon death. Great, might as well have hit him with a bus in the end credits of the next Phoenix Wright. Still, as I said, he looks, talks and acts different in this game, so if it makes you feel any better you could pretend he's actually Frank's twatty cousin Marlon, who didn't get any of the lovable genes, but crikey does he know a lot about the Evil Dead films. The goal of Hitman 2016 seems to have been to create a modular platform for Hitman gameplay into which new levels can be inserted in my fly. Sorry, I meant on the fly, get your hands off me. The game's six missions were sold episodically for ten bucks apiece, more or less a month apart, a rather clever way to disguise the fact that your full price game isn't very long. I use the same technique in my lovemaking. Between every thrust I bolt from the house and book a caravanning weekend in Castle Douglas. Every now and again you'll overhear two civvies saying something like, hey that bloke in the penthouse suite with the big target painted on his face sure loves to drink out of a water bottle with a skull and crossbones logo. Really? That would be jolly easy to swap with poison if one happened to be an assassin. Yes, it fucking would! Speak up a little, I can't hear you over our waiter being strangled by a giant packet of frozen cod fillets. It starts with you trying to knock out a guard without noticing he had a friend watching you in the reflection of his shiny bell end. Then a bunch of guards come over so you knock all of them out, but then the civilian who was supposed to escort the ice cream man to the birthday party, or indeed any armed psychopath who happens to be dressed like one, gets freaked out by the nine unconscious guards in varying states of undress and you lose the opportunity, and the cock-ups just escalate and escalate until you give up and reload. Next time it goes great until someone unexpectedly walks in while you're pulling the unconscious ice cream man's trousers down and gets the wrong idea and you have to go along with it, meet the ice cream man's parents, get a civil partnership, go on a magical honeymoon to the Seychelles, and all the time the game's going, there goes the no kills bonus, and the no bodies found bonus, and the never spotted bonus, and the never accidentally got stuck in a loveless marriage bonus. All you're offering is scavenger hunts, and I got sick of those a long time ago when my uncle used to make me play Guess Where I Put the Fun Size Twigs. Oh, if only my cat were here, exclaims Cat in a moment of stress, whereupon her cat literally walks nonchalantly into shot from the lower right. Oh, there he is! I love it, it's like something from the beginner's guide to screenwriting for audiences with no attention span. First, the plot is helping to save the poor mining community out of gratitude for being enslaved by them. Then we come to a big city with a class divide problem and overthrow the corrupt government. Then after we've done that, a giant monster shows up, which we immediately defeat. Then the game goes, ah, fuck it, let's just go back to the city from the first game and fight another unrelated corrupt government. And then you have to fight Sailor Moon or some bollocks. What's that? The budget's nearly run out? Oh well, let's just pick a character at random and have them turn into a giant blob of faces and tits for want of a final boss fight. Then smash cut to credits the instant it dies. There, that's a game. 60 bucks, please. Resident Evil 7 again reworks the formula from the ground up. Now it's first person, much tighter in scope, emphasising the horror part of survival horror, and Capcom have finally figured out how to write a half-decent story. They got someone else to do it. It's also emphasising the resident part of Resident Evil because it takes place entirely in a spooky residence. Well, three or four spooky residences, but it's set in rural America where there's fuck all to do in the winter except build yourself another house. RE7 has taken a lot of cues from that popular breed of claustrophobic first-person chasey-chasey horror of the slender and out 
outlast sort of area that for a while was using steam the way parasitic wasps use the bodies of caterpillars. The kind of thing that goes, no, you can only run away and hide because we decided not being able to fight back is scarier and it's just coincidental that it's also massively easier to program. Resident Evil 7 looked at that and said, how about we do that, but also, weird idea, give the player a big fuck off gun. So why do you bother letting us have weapons anywhere other than in boss fights, Resident Evil 7? Well, uh, there's still all those crates to smash. All right, fine, we'll throw in some standard monsters for you to kill in between the redneck funtime hoedowns. Here comes some now! Woo, scary! I look at the monsters, and then at RE7, and then back at the monsters. Is this a fucking joke? They look like theme park mascots, they've got huge curvy smiles, they look like the dude in the original Japanese Godzilla costume went on a crash diet and fell in a septic tank. They slowly lurch around like they're balancing books on their heads, and every time I hit them with anything they spend about half an hour recoiling from it like they're trying to get me sent off the pitch. I do recommend Resident Evil 7, I like the story and its reveals, the tighter focus, the fact that it's not Resident Evil 6, but then after Resident Evil 6 I'd have been pleasantly surprised by a dead prawn in a sock. It's official, the Yakuza series is now the long-running Yakuza series. There's quite a few of them now, and this month saw the release of its long-awaited zeroth installment, Yakuza Zero, a prequel in which we discover how Kazuma Kiryu went from being a sharp-dressed man with a brick for a face who likes disco stomping people into a sharp-dressed man with a brick for a face who likes disco stomping people in a slightly different suit. We also learn how fan favourite series regular Goro Majima went from being a sharp-dressed man with a brick for a face who likes disco stomping people into a boggle-eyed weirdo who dresses like he woke up naked in a pet cemetery. I am fond of the Yakuza games, but honestly I have trouble articulating why. Which is a shame, because that's me fucking job. Kiryu is accused of murdering someone he merely disco stomped six or seven times, which he couldn't possibly have died from, because this is Yakuza, where everyone's face is a car from antique wooden furniture, so he's forced to leave the Yakuza and become an estate agent. The kind of estate agent that dresses up in a disco suit and resolves tenancy disputes by stomping groups of four or five serious-faced men. Meanwhile, Majima is being punished for past fuck-ups by being given a glamorous high-end nightclub to manage. Fuck, better toe the line, Majima, mate. Next time they might punish you with a key to the executive toilet, until he's ordered to kill someone and ends up trying to protect them, since he's also a bit unclear on this whole organised crime thing. Kiryu has to run his real estate enterprise by buying up local businesses, another in a long list of 100% completion collectible side quests made slightly more obnoxious because there's no way of knowing which businesses you can buy until you run up and press your face against the window. And if there's one or two left you haven't bought, the game has no way to tell you where the fucking things are, so I have to run up and down the street leaving a greasy smear all along the frontage. Meanwhile, Majima has to run a cabaret club with one of those restaurant management casual games that your mum likes almost as much as living next door to the dockyard. Our main character is William, an Irish sailor with a mysterious ability to see demons and guardian spirits because he is Irish and therefore constantly drunk. After his own guardian spirit is stolen from him by a bloke who looks like Emperor Palpatine on spring break, William pursues him to Japan at the onset of the historical Edo period, accidentally becomes a samurai embroiled in the conflicts of the time and goes down in history as the first ever weeaboo, which is roughly how the locals pronounce his name. And it's the spirit of Deadliest Warrior that brings us Ubisoft's latest multiplayer focused Skinner box, Foreigner. So called because it's about how people of different races and creeds will never ever get along under any circumstances. Specifically, it concerns a permanent three way conflict between medieval knights, medieval Vikings, and, uh, Japanese samurai. Which, from a geographical perspective, is kind of like King Leonidas and the 300 Spartans showing up to join in the Falklands conflict. Whatever, it's a fantasy. Three communities of knights, Vikings, and samurai all live within five minutes' drive of each other, and they smack the shit out of their neighbours all day because it's easier than learning the Norwegian for stop kicking your ball over my fence. And each mission is a handful of generic sword fights with bots connected by story moments that play like scenes from a Klingon soap opera directed by a narcoleptic mole. Why do we fight? Long pause, awkward stare. We fight because we are warriors. Characters shuffle around a bit like they didn't entirely memorise their cues. Valhalla! Characters standing either side of us eventually figure out they're supposed to be joining in. Which faction is the best? The shouty overdramatic cunts with the slow but strong one, the fast but weak one, inevitably the lady, and the in-betweeny one, or the other two groups of shouty overdramatic cunts with the etc etc. Oh, but there are subtle differences in what special moves the individual characters can pull off. Like there's that one samurai with the pokey poison and spear, whose special move is to go fuck themselves. I'm willing to bet it crossed Nintendo's mind more than once to call its new console the Switch, but thankfully cooler heads prevailed and for once we have a Nintendo console whose name actually means something. An appropriate meaning as well, for a Switch is another name for a beating stick with which one might conceivably flog a dead horse. You've got two options once you detach the controllers, you can either continue waving the two ends around like a complete pillock with two garage door remotes, or you can give yourself a well-deserved slap, insert them into the special housing that turns them into a standard controller, and come and join us in the fucking real world. Breath of the Wild is a new Zelda most closely comparable to Zelda Twilight Princess, in that it too is being released for both a new and an old console, and is most definitely a more advisable purchase for the old, because the old has other games, not to mention a degree of backwards compatibility and isn't going to charge you a subscription to play the same old Nintendo tat you've been repeatedly buying and rebuying for the last 40 fucking years. What is interesting is that Breath of the Wild takes a decisively hands-off approach to structure. The traditional Zelda linear acquisition of useful stocking fillers that gradually open up the map is nowhere to be seen. In fact, if you want, you can jog straight from the tutorial area to the final boss fight and take him on. You'll get fucking well. You'll need to be conveyed back to the save point between two slices of bread, but it's nice to see Nintendo finally acknowledge the many obsessive psychopaths in their core fan base. Hey, bet you can't speedrun this game, you insane beautiful bastards, says Nintendo with a sly wink, knowing full well the speedrun will
will be online inside a day, and by week two they'll be posting blindfolded speedruns on Guitar Hero controllers using only their knobs. Speaking of weird smells, Aloy is an outcast from her tribe due to the circumstances of her birth, and can only learn those circumstances by proving herself a hunter. But this is only the beginning as Aloy finds herself setting out into the wider world to unravel the mystery of her existence and discover the true story of what happened to the planet. See, what they're doing here is starting with a narrow focus on Aloy and her personal issues so that the scope can naturally broaden out over time to encompass the fate of the whole world in a manner that reflects how our personal scope of the game world gradually broadens as we explore it and uncover more of the map. A bit of ludonarrative synchronicity that will be appreciated by anyone who can determine what the fuck I'm on about. I'm about to play something other than a wilderness sandbox now, so if you're expecting me to do Ghost Recon Wildlands next week, then feel free to go suck the spiders out of Tom Clancy's dead grey cock. So I was gratified to see the property franchising with this new sequel, Near Automata, which the casual eye would indicate to be largely bugger all to do with the original, but after reviewing Near the first I have since learned that it too was a sequel to Drakengard, and I think I could be forgiven for not realising that. It might as well have declared itself a sequel to Mrs. Doubtfire for all that it mattered. You might want to be careful being so laissez-faire with the definition of sequel, next thing you know everything will be declared a sequel to everything else, and they'll be selling Moby Dick in box sets with confessions of a window cleaner. 2B is assisted by a hacker named 9S. Hacker in the video game sense of basically also a warrior but with a 70% increase in minigame density. I don't think 9S has a hidden meaning, unless the 9 is supposed to be his approximate physical age, but Wikipedia does tell me that 9 is an exponential factorial and 9S certainly wants to exponentially factorise 2B, wink wink. It's like there was an argument over whether Nier should be an action RPG or a bullet hell shooter and the action RPG guy won, but the bullet hell shooter guy decided to bide his time and play the long game, so Nier 3 will finally be entirely bullet hell and the action RPG guy's corpse will be found in the parking lot with 900 million gunshot wounds. The second half had some pretty good gut punch story twists that managed to make some emotion spark off my flinty heart, but it could be because I've been stuck revisiting the same locations with these characters for so long that I'd gotten invested largely through Stockholm Syndrome. It is a very weird game, on every level of story and gameplay design, and that might be enough. Weirdness is refreshing. In the general blandness of life, weirdness alone is worth preserving. That's why we drew the line at nuking Japan more than twice. Well, as I said from the stretcher after I came runner-up in the all-county lard-eating contest, no one can say I didn't try. And that's not the only way in which Ghost Recon Wildlands paralleled an afternoon trying to hold down a stomach full of disgusting, highly processed fat. I knew it was yet another Ubisoft sandbox game and therefore another round of blandly visiting icons on maps like an overworked Uber driver, but I didn't expect it to be THE Ubisoft sandbox game, the ultimate archetype at long last. Come on, Yahtzee, be nice, every game deserves a fair chance, even the obvious dog shit. I hope you're satisfied, Ubisoft, because you've destroyed sandbox games. Homefront the revolution didn't manage that. Millie bad sandboxes at least throw the decent ones into sharp relief, but you did it by grinding them out month after month until they were nothing but tedious to-do lists with all the bumps sanded off. We were like school kids finding a dead dog behind the playing field. We were having a great time poking it with a stick and saying it was Lee Drummond's girlfriend, but you were the kid who took it too far and ruined everybody's fun. You picked up the dead dog and put it on your head and chased us around with it until the stomach burst and now everyone stinks of rotten half-digested chappy. When I accidentally parachuted into a crevice I couldn't escape from because there's no fucking jump button, I was confronted by yet another opportunity for player choice. I could choose to fast travel somewhere and start the journey again, or I could quit and play Night in the Woods instead. So in summary, Night in the Woods is a solid worth checking out if strong writing is enough to make you forgive the very slow pacing and gameplay taking a back seat. Wait, was I talking about something else? Ah, it can't have been important. How do we continue this story that could have gone one of three ways? How can a story set in the universe where we picked pistachio ice cream possibly also follow on from the universe where everyone got Neapolitan? Bioware's solution seems to have been to wash their hands of the business completely. Whatever you picked, everything just worked out, alright? The Milky Way galaxy's fine. Well done. All the races are getting along and they just bought a new puppy together. Peace and prosperity forever. Kind of boring, actually. You probably wouldn't be interested. Oh gosh, what's that over there? Looks like a whole new galaxy just packed to the gills with intrigue and peril. Why don't you go look at that one instead? Off you go, don't bother sending postcards, you mustn't dwell. Shoo, shoo. Let me ask you something. If an alien came down from space and walked among us as ambassador to beyond the furthest stars, would it ever occur to you to call him over and ask if he wouldn't mind popping down the shops to run you a couple of errands? Maybe that's partly why Bioware games always speed down the uncanny valley like a herd of autistic wildebeest. It's not just that all the characters look and act like department store dummies with snap-on plastic hairdos. The game feels like it was written by one as well. Mass Effect Andromeda is what is termed in the modern vernacular a soft reboot. Technically a sequel, but refuses to move out of the original's apartment, occasionally steals its clothes and maybe plotting a deranged single white female-esque murder and replacement fantasy. Going to every random planet, pointing to each one and getting a teaspoonful of crafting resources isn't exactly stimulating Mass Effect. Hmm. Would it help if we made the journey to each planet excruciatingly slow and dull and force you to watch it every single time you travel anywhere? No, I don't think that would help Mass Effect, but keep trying, I hear there's a lot of money in anesthesiology. See, after the last game was popularly considered to have 
have a worse conclusion than the fucking 1930s, I felt duty-bound to power through the story end in the limited time I had available. The result was a rather tepid The Adventure Continues affair, but what's important is that having skipped a large degree of the side stuff, there were three entire planet sandboxes I hadn't so much as set foot in. So what the hell is all this tedious side bollocks for if I can do in the final boss perfectly comfortably without it? To see the grateful looks on the quest giver's faces? It's a Bioware game, they'd make the same face if I pissed on their shoes. But this era saw such wonderfully varied titles as Banjo-Kazooie by Rare, Donkey Kong 64, also by Rare, Conker's Bad Fur Day by Industrial Light and Magic, just kidding, it was Rare again. You know what, let's forget about examples, this isn't fucking TV tropes. Let's focus on Banjo-Kazooie, because this new game I've been playing, Ukulele, is to Banjo-Kazooie what Mighty Number no. 9 was to Mega Man, proof if proof be needed that there is no sector of nostalgia so obsolete, nor so loose in its interpretation of the spirit of copyright law that you can't get a couple of thousand people on Kickstarter to pony up for a thinly veiled copy-paste with the names changed. I always find something obnoxious about this too-cool-for-school kind of dealio. It's like walking into a Santa's grotto to find a slouched and disinterested Santa beard askew who jerks a thumb towards a bag of toys on the floor before returning his attention to his copy of the Racing Post. Hey, more power to you for your irreverent subversion of my expectations, but you still charged me ten bucks for this shit. And here's another power that lets you take on the qualities of things you touch with your tongue. What does that mean, ukulele? Because I've been licking this picture of David Hasselhoff for hours and I don't feel any more virile. No, no, it's just some things. Like you can lick a fire to become a fire lizard and walk through fire barriers. Ukulele, I just hurt myself on a flaming torch. I didn't mean any fire. Ugh. We are bog standard, mute yet paradoxically good at making friends JRPG protagonist who was on probation for a crime he didn't commit and is sent to a last chance school where he discovers he has the ability to enter a strange other world formed from the minds and hearts of evil humans and that he can then steal the source of those humans' malevolence and make them better people in the real world. Also, for some reason he has to do this while dressed like he has to go straight from a wedding reception to an S&M party. If you're going to make a 60 hour RPG, have a speck of fucking mercy and have more than one music track for standard battles. Doesn't matter how good the track is, Bohemian Rhapsody is good but if I had to listen to the first 30 seconds of it 40 times an hour for three days, I'd end up wanting to travel back in time and skull fuck the idea out of Freddie Mercury's living brain. And the game's also a little unintuitive about what constitutes a time slot filling activity. You can get the metro to the pawn shop, flog a bunch of loot from the last dungeon, take another metro to the bookshop in the red light district to buy a copy of Razzle, and no time will pass at all. But sit down at your desk to craft one fucking lockpick and there goes the fucking afternoon. And then sometimes the game goes into a prolonged story phase and several days of cutscenes will go by with no opportunity to do anything else. So if you've got rented DVDs due back then you can piss up a chimney, Joe Titwank. And there's a new mode where you can play through the game as Duke Nukem. I'm guessing Duke Nukem was the only one to return their phone calls. Because I can't imagine the Bulletstorm devs sitting down and saying, right, who can we add to our game who embodies in our audience's minds success, high quality, and having a realistic understanding of one's value and capabilities? How about Duke Nukem? What an excellent suggestion, Crispin. Let's go with that. Obviously I'm being sarcastic, and since it's so obvious I'm going to omit this sentence from the official transcript of this meeting. Unfortunately, the metaphorical monkey on Full Throttle's back, or perhaps I should say Monkey Island on its back, is that it has to be compared to the other classic LucasArts adventure games, among which it would be the runt of the litter, if it weren't for the dig, staggering around on its one functional leg, leaking on the carpet from every body part that can leak. The last remastering I'd like to bring up this week is perhaps the definitive example of aging poorly, second only to a fruit bowl in direct sunlight. I give you Parappa the Rapper remastered on PS4, which some people seem to remember fondly, but which looked to me like a string of cutscenes that couldn't be enlarged beyond native PS1 resolution, and as such you could miss entirely if a medium-sized fly lands on your TV screen, broken up by a total of six gameplay sections consisting of the crumbs of gameplay that fall off a modern game if you hold it upside down and shake it vigorously. What the fuck do you want? If you tell me to crack 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 the egg against the bowl one more time, I'm going to crack 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 your head against a plinth. You are ace cameraman Blake something or other, who comes with his wife to hillbilly murderer country to cover a story, and makes the rookie error of showing up in a helicopter which in video game intro sequences hold together like a jammy dodger in the back pocket of a pair of jogging bottoms. So the inevitable happens and he's got to rescue his wife from both a Christian death cult and a pagan death cult that appear to be at odds but seem to find plenty of common ground when it comes to doing horrible horrible things to Blake's gormless ass. Again, maybe Resident Evil 7 ruined this with all that chainsaw based overzealous manicure business because I swear Outlast 2 is trying to break the horrible inescapable torture in first person record. Fucking hell, it's like the Passion of the Christ VR edition. Yahtzee, clearly Blake needs the camera's night vision mode to see in all the places that aren't lit by strung up burning homosexuals. Alright, but why does he keep recording stuff and why can we watch the stuff he records back to hear some of his internal thoughts on them? Like he's boring us to death with his holiday snaps. And this is the mass grave I had to claw out of and there's me being violated and there's me being violated from a slightly different angle and there's me hallucinating my old elementary school but obviously you can't see that because it was conjured from my fevered brain. Warrior carries certain connotations. You picture bold powerful figures clashing on the field of battle, muscle quivering against muscle like an earthquake in a leather goods shop. But if a sniper was involved in that there'd only be one bold powerful figure standing by themselves looking confused on the field of battle before there's a distant cough of cordite and their head explodes. But anyway the game opens with a flashback to two brothers. The older, brash, confident and already enrolled in the military. The younger, more shy and troubled and looking to the older with hero worship. Now if you think you've guessed which of these brothers will be our underdog protagonist then you've been misled by your basic storytelling instincts you big stupid cunt. When North isn't using his sniper rifle 
rival to make people's jawbones spin around like football rattles, he largely spends his time finding persons of interest and getting information from them. He has a three-step process for doing so. First he asks them a question, then he asks it again but with a period between each word, then he usually just threatens to smash their teeth in. Seems like every single person we shoot is a bald, bearded Russian with angry domestic violence eyes, and when we are given information on targets they always seem to be dastardly criminals on top of whatever reason we have for shooting them. Blimey, he's a high-ranking mercenary, a drug dealer, and a serial rapist. He must have very good time management skills. I can barely work on two projects in the week. I wonder how far they're willing to push this. I'm already having to call the sequel police every time they reboot an old game and not change the title, and now look. The first game to be named Prey isn't particularly old, and more to the point is somewhere on the low end of bugger all to do with this new game called Prey. Watch it, Bethesda, this is the kind of bullshit that brings down the sequel Feds. Alright, both games are about alien invasions, but by that logic it might as well have been called Space Invaders Episode 973. This really goes to show how utterly allergic these bean-counting, creatively bankrupt loaves of chunky shite are to new ideas. They had a perfectly acceptable original IP and still felt the need to slap on whatever pre-existing name they could find clinging to the side of the rubbish chute. On that note, Prey just can't get enough of murdering me without warning. I'm sure it never stops being funny for it. Oops, the enemy created a big bomb right next to you where you didn't look and it didn't have line of sight, why didn't you dodge it, you loser? Oh, you thought you could increase your spacesuit thrust speed and lightly brush against a wall? Dead. That's what we do to hurrying heralds. Oh, what's this now? You're trying to walk across an empty room? I think someone forgot to stay at least ten feet away from broken electrical panels. Zap! Blimey, was that built by the same contractor that made the consoles on the Starship Enterprise? So I've been fiddling with the Oculus Rift lately and have been playing a new game that the Oculus people seem to be really trying to push. Wilson's Heart. Not to be confused with Wilson's Hearth, which is the fireplace especially for former presidents named Woodrow. That wasn't exactly A material, was it? Fuck it, move on. This was also my first time using the motion controls, or to use the proper name, the fucking motion controls. So the potential for deep gameplay is limited. It's more suited to the sort of thing that's euphemistically billed as an experience rather than a game. Where there's a fruit bowl, and you pick up a banana, and then you look at the banana, and then I guess that's where you're supposed to reach orgasm. This is how we're bypassing the motion sickness problem. Instead of free movement, we jump from position to position like the original Mist. But hey, there are people who still think of Mist as a classic, generally people who haven't played it lately. And I don't feel nauseous. I'm just getting a headache like I'm stuck in a metal lift with a concert brass section. Throughout the game we find bodies drained of blood and conclude there's a vampire about. Now, one of the NPCs is tall, thin, with a widow's peak and pointy ears, and is named Bella, as in Lugosi. No, seriously. Of course, he's not the vampire, but what bothers me is how, after that's revealed, the game seems so fucking pleased with itself. Bet you thought he was the vampire, you silly sausage. Ha ha, crow crow. Actually, I didn't, Wilson's heart, because I was giving you one nano angstrom of credit. I don't know if the surge is as short as Lords of the Fallen, I've heard it is, but I couldn't say because I stopped playing at the third boss. In fact, let's not mince words, I think I might hate the surge. I feel like I've been easier going lately, it's probably because I have a small dog now, but I forgot how much I enjoy really hating things. It's like putting on a favourite old sweater and smacking yourself in the balls with your childhood teddy. And the surge got off to such a promising start, too. We open on a futuristic train with our slightly generic main character, Warren, so called because he likes sticking rabbits up his bum. The hate only came when I was taking on the third boss. It's a big industrial machine with about nine things on it trying to kill you, fair enough, but for some turbo-cocking reason, every time you attack one, the game auto-targets it, leaving you staring blissfully into its eyes as its eight friends are winding up attacks where you can't see. Get past that and I can start attacking the core, but if you target it, fucking switches to a fixed camera so I can barely see what I'm doing. What's got into you, camera? Is this about the pissing on the bus seat comment? Finally, after much frustration and about 900 attempts, I've gotten the core on the ropes and have moments from landing the final blow, whereupon I glitched through the floor and fall to my death. No. That's too much. That's gone right over the Tropic of Fuckabout on a jet ski full of dicks. I'm done. Fuck the Surge, fuck Deck 13, fuck anyone who likes it. Blimey, that's filled my schedule out for the week. Still, as I believe I said last time, the one-on-one -on -one fighting game and the superhero comics universe are an actual combo, as both are concerned with larger-than-life characters beating the snot out of each other for one incredibly contrived reason after another. The broad incredibly contrived reason running through the Injustice property is a falling out between Batman and Superman over whether or not killing people is good. Batman takes the position that killing is the uncrossable line at which all negotiation breaks breaks down and vigilance gives way to tyranny, while Superman takes the position that wow wow, I'm really sad and cross and I'm not going to tidy my room so there. Also, I wonder if some of the choices of D-list character editions might have been affected by what assets Netherrealm already had lying around. We had Killer Frost last time and now Captain Cold, I suspect because they'd already made a load of ice effects for Sub-Zero in the last Mortal Kombat game, who incidentally is also getting added to this game as DLC, which is an act of supreme redundancy. That is, at best, putting a cherry on top of another cherry that already had a cherry on it. Still got no idea what the fuck a bounce cancel is unless it's a surefire way to disappoint a 
children's party. But you know what? Injustice 2 is like a puppy chewing a fire extinguisher. Charming in its stupidity, but I'd rather watch it on YouTube than have it in my house. He's partnered for most of the game with Robert Burns, famous Scottish poet and author of Auld Lang Syne. Here reimagined as a nine foot shaved bear of a man who's so grizzled he can peel potatoes by rubbing them on his chin. And as for badass, his ass is so bad it denies the Holocaust and fraudulently uses disabled parking spaces. That aside, Vanquish is also a PC port of a last generation game. So let's take a moment now to share our favourite bugs. That one where you took double damage if the game was running 60 FPS must have been a nightmare for hardcore PC gamers, for whom playing at 30 FPS is apparently like trying to breathe with a plastic bag on their head. The measure I was given to correct the bug added a whole bunch of exciting new ones, like on one level I kept falling through the floor and dying before the screen had faded in. Loading screen, pause, hideous dying scream, reload, repeat. It was like playing a blunt dramatisation of stillbirth. E3 has come around again and without my usual roundup of the show it may inflict that most insidious of modern diseases, optimism. But at the same time I kind of want to review Friday the 13th the game, which I've been weirdly absorbed by lately and I don't want to put it off another week so what do I talk about? This nihilistic horror experience in which a lumbering faceless idiot endeavours to bleed numerous young people dry, or Friday the 13th the game? That's when I realised the answer was staring me in the face. All I have to do is review E3 using analogies to Friday the 13th the game. So with that in mind, let's run down yet another handful of shows in which highly scrubbed people with earpieces and well-trained speaking voices attempt to get as excited about games as hackneyed and unoriginal as Friday the 13th the game's map variety. The only teased Xbox exclusive that gave me any kind of tickle squirt was Crackdown 3, and even that rang alarm bells because Terry Crews was in it. And celebrities just scream distraction tactic. It's as distracting as the tendency of certain public Jason players to get into character by narrating all their actions in a furious comedy bellow. Yeah, new David Cage game about emotionless robots with only vague ideas on how to act human. Fuck, great idea David Cage, play to your strengths. Old Man Nintendo had a better showing, although that Mario vs Rabbids game makes you wonder if Ubisoft is trying to steal their pension checks. Fair play to them, Mario Odyssey needed a new angle and it found one. They've done Mario Becomes a Raccoon, they've done Mario Becomes a Cat, but they've never done Mario Becomes a Tunneling Brain Parasite. Spliced my urethra, Nintendo were working on a game entitled Metroid Prime 4. That's literally all we know, the title. This is where one of those shit game journalists would say, let's stay optimistic. But this is Nintendo we're talking about. They've shown a bigger grudge against Metroid fans than I have against playing as Jasons with a fast swim ability when you need to swim about as often as a cat made of soluble aspirin. In conclusion, Friday the 13th the game is like most one versus group multiplayer games in that it's basically hide and seek with extra steps, but the core rules of it create enough effective a suspense to draw me in despite its lack of polish and slight problem with random players acting like twats. Meanwhile, E3 has all the polish in the world and is a fucking twat safari. So that's the final comparison. Jason sucks down damage and hacks up kids, E3 damages kids and sucks off hacks. We've got roguelike dungeon crawlers, we've got roguelike space sims, we've got whatever the fuck the binding of Isaac is, we've got roguelike Castlevania style platformers, roguelike Mega Man style platformers, roguelike straight platformer on the rocks. I hear there's even a roguelike investigative Lovecraftian horror adventure game by some jolly talented indie developer who certainly isn't rubbing himself through his trouser pocket as he types this. No, I don't mean Darkest Dungeon, shut up. Strafe's just a nice, nostalgic, comfortable place for me. It takes me right back to my youth playing games like Quake and Dune Nukem 3D and who can masturbate to Climax in the school showers without Mr. Trevor's noticing. Imagine my disappointment, listener. Hmm. Right, that's enough imagining, here's the real stuff. Oh yes, and then a prisoner begs me to release him, and a bit of text comes up to none too subtly inform me that my actions will have consequences. Of course they will. Walking across a room has consequences. The consequence is that I'm on the other side of the fucking room. I know what it really means, that we're strapping in for some of that branching narrative bullshit. So a short ways in, when I randomly press an unlabeled button that lets all the crazy murderers out, I'm informed that I'm a bad person for doing so, and not randomly pressing the other, identical unlabeled button that provides free breakfast to poor school children and brings Scrambles the Wonder Dog back to life. There's a lot of acting going on in game even, which is not quite the same thing as acting. Acting is what amateur dramatics productions do when they've been informed there might be a casting agent in the audience. When I had pieced together the plot, I concluded it was about a bunch of unlikable soap opera characters making long strings of stupid decisions, beginning with their haircuts and only going downhill from there. I have a revelation to make that may blow your little minds apart, listeners. Ready? I quite like Dark Souls. Phew, glad to have gotten that off my chest. It starts to weigh on me if I don't make it clear 60 or 70 times per week. But during this confused transitionary period, a little company called Naughty Dog, responsible up to then for a few nondescript titles like Keith the Thief, said, hey, let's see if there's a way to make a 3D platformer that doesn't feel like directing a kitten around an air hockey table. And if possible, let's see if we can do it while climbing aboard Sony's massive todger and banking their checks for the rest of our fucking lives. Now all we need is a plot. Okay, how about something like Sonic the Hedgehog meets... Actually, fuck it, let's just leave it at that. So we end up with Crash Bandicoot, in which a mad scientist with nothing better to do with his time than pick on small furry animals gets decked by one of the furry animals who has acquired advanced offensive capability by putting on some shoes and spinning around a lot. Now, I owned Crash Bandicoot 1 on the PS1 and actually 100%ed it back in the day, before I had more games vying for my attention than Daniel Radcliffe has weird smelling fans, and as I played the remake and watched myself miss a ledge for the 14th time in a row, I became convinced that something fundamental had changed, besides dimmed vision and stiff hands from 20 years of self abuse, and I'm led to understand that I was right. Mr. Bandicoot's hitbox is slightly 
slightly more rounded than in the originals, making him slide off ledges easier, so it was only partly the wanking. All three games are an adventure in completing the sentence that begins with the words those fucking, as in those fucking bridge levels, those fucking motorbike races out of nowhere, or those fucking chase levels where you have to run towards the camera so you can only see about two inches of the upcoming road, and hazards require reacting quicker than the amount of time between arriving at your girlfriend's parents' house and them starting to judge you. My first idea for this episode of the Zero Punctuation Occasional Guide to Gaming's Most Voluminous Trouser Shitting Incidents was that we could all laugh at the virtual boy, tee hee hee. But that didn't feel too revelatory, you know. Nintendo's headache inducing Mask of the Red Death didn't do so well. The N64 had the power, the IP, and the good reputation. There was just one tiny little massive cargo container full of bat smegma sitting on the N64 railroad tracks, and it had the word cartridges written along the side. Cartridges did have merits, they load fast and are sturdy enough to still work after you smack your brother with it for asking for their turn, but the same is true of an articulated truck and you wouldn't pick up your dinner date in one. But there were many factors leading to the Saturn's failure. Some blame the cancellation of its one and only Sonic game, Sonic Extreme, which would have been the 3D Sonic to counter Mario 64. And yes, I think it's a shame we didn't discover early on that Sonic and 3D meet the way the German invading infantry met the Siberian winter. Perhaps a lot of later unpleasantness could have been avoided. I didn't even mention the console I had, the Amiga CD32. The console so good it had to be discontinued and declare bankruptcy after six months to give everyone else a chance. Then there was the 3DO with its wonderful FMV games that made human flesh look like biscuit dough smeared in water-based lubricant. Or the Atari Jaguar, technically the world's first 64-bit console, in that at least 64 people looked at it and said, well, it's a bit like a console, I guess, but what's with the controller that looks like a Genesis controller got knocked up by a pocket calculator? Mm. You know, on second thoughts, healthy competition wasn't the right choice of words. Slightly run-down competition, maybe. Or how about competition that could probably get out of bed given a drip, a wheelchair, and the second coming of Jesus? You know, in this age of fear-mongering populist takeover, increasing class divide, and Ed Sheeran cameos on Game of Thrones, a lot of people seem to take comfort in the fact that the mushroom cloud will probably drop soon and burn our eyes out while the radiation agonisingly dissolves us from the inside out. Well, it's a lovely fantasy, millennials, but sadly we're an infuriatingly adaptable bunch, and if Nuclear Firestorm couldn't save us from the Bay City Rollers, it's not going to save you from, discreetly Google's current Billboard Top 40, Imagine Dragons. I think the key phrase that sums up the Yonder experience is, what the fuck am I supposed to do with this? It is the final destination for every path you can take. You explore the island, find a hidden ore vein in a cave, mine it for copper, then you have some copper. What the fuck am I supposed to do with this? Oh look, a place where I can build a bridge if I bring it 20 sticks, 10 vines, and a tube of prit stick. It leads me to an island with a treasure chest containing a vajazzling kit. What the fuck am I supposed to do with this? I think we're supposed to be setting up farms. So we search the land and find the places where farms can be built and build farms on them. What the fuck am I- Wait! Now we can find a wild cow, wave a curly whirly under its nose, and lead it back to the farm to make it your cow. Okay, what the fuck? ta 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 Now find an NPC whose face you particularly don't like and you'd like to go away. Feed them the entire contents of your fridge and they'll go off and run your farm for you. There, you see? Now you've got free milk coming out of the farm whenever you want it. And what the fuck am I supposed to do with that? Look, if you like directions so much, maybe we could get you a fucking kaleidoscope. Oh, Splatoon 2, please don't think I've been avoiding you. I know I've been knocking off a string of indie games since he came out, and I already regret giving time to that yonder the Child Toucher Chronicles or whatever it was, but the thing is, I get a terrible sense of foreboding whenever I do a Nintendo game. As I speak, there are fanboys just lying in wait to copy-paste one of the usual statements into this video's comment box, either, well, this reflects his obvious bias against Nintendo, or how surprising that he liked it considering his obvious bias against Nintendo. You start the game and you're back in the same squid city with the same player avatars distributed about the main square, with speed bubbles coming off showing what that player scribbled into the message window while excrementally bored one day. Interestingly, this time around I saw very few messages to the effect of, ooh, Nintendo are great and I want to kiss them on the knob, which might reflect a bit of a societal mood shift. Or perhaps more likely Nintendo are getting lazier about the message filtering this time. Actually, a lot of the messages I saw were related to furries for some reason. I have a fursona, hooray for furries, I wish it to be known that I'm a very unreliable dog sitter. Was there some kind of call to action in some dark, embarrassing corner of the internet? Does a squid-human hybrid count as a furry, strictly speaking? Or is this just a case of any port in a storm until the new Sonic comes out and they can all whack themselves cross-eyed? The game match makes about as well as a Victorian orphan with severe frostbite, so I was going up against dudes all the way up to level 20, but I was still routinely coming up top of the list for most floor piddled on. Something's not right here. I'm notoriously shit at multiplayer, why are you all being shitter? Is it because you have an average age of nine and a half? But no answer came, because you can only talk to each other through a fucking phone app. Which is a risky move on Nintendo's part, because while fiddling with my phone I might decide I'd rather be playing Bejeweled, or that I could get pretty much the same experience as Splatoon voice chat by ringing up the local kindergarten and then yelling that Santa isn't real. Finally, one thing I was privileged to witness was a Splatfest, a one-day event that left me very confused indeed. It started with a TV asking me if I preferred ketchup or mayo. So like any red-blooded Englishman, I chose ketchup over that insipid, colourless McChicken sandwich ruiner. I was then invited to battle it out against Team Mayo in standard matches, but after I joined one along with three other Team Ketchup kids, we were kept waiting about five minutes before the enemy team also filled up with Team Ketchup. This happened for every single match, which at first I put down to Team Mayo being as popular as a used tampon in a jacuzzi, but then at the end of the Splatfest, Team Mayo had won the most rounds. Where? I never saw a single Mayo molester. Did I just misunderstand the concept? The winner was whichever team won the most points against itself. I'm not sure if that counts as self-harm or masturbation. You know what, I kind of suspect it was a programming fuck-up, because I noticed one of the dudes in the opposing team on one match went by the name Agent Mayo, and it seemed unlikely that such a person would be ketchup-aligned. Unless
unless he was a double Agent Mayo, in which case watch your back, Agent. Team Mayo don't forgive turncoats. You can run, but they'll find you in the end. You'll be walking the streets of Rio one day thinking you've finally lost them when you turn around and BAM! Ruined chicken sandwich. This very serious game about serious issues takes itself way too fucking seriously. And before you start clipping out that statement to make a hilarious dance mix out of it, obviously I wasn't expecting custard pies and a laugh track. What I mean is, Hellblade Hoot Selena Scott's attempt at poe facedness is let down by the fact that the main character looks like a blue tinged dork and apparently took acting lessons from the scenery chewer's guide to milking it. It's like she's only got two settings urgent deer in the headlights, frightened whispering, and furious defiant screaming with teeth clenched together like two piano keyboards in a sleeping bag. If you die too many times throughout the course of the game, it'll delete your progress. Now, from a purely gameplay focused perspective, this is of course the worst idea since Hitler's dad started taking fertility medicine because it's effectively punishing the player for acquiring a normal learning curve, but from a narrative perspective it makes a lot of sense because it is the sort of thing that could potentially drive me completely up the wall. And you have to admit, it's a ballsy fucking move, at least on the surface. In practice, don't be too put off by the prospect because I died in the combat precisely once in the entire course of the game. Saints Row escalated to its final gushing purple orgasm and it's time to move on with a new IP. Oh, said Volition, but we can still make it a shooty drivey sandbox, can't we? Of course volition, after all it's what you know, and there can never be enough sandbox games, apparently. Can we put some characters from Saints Row in it? I don't see why not, volition, cameos and callbacks are fun and rewarding for the long term fans, and only mildly annoying for everyone else. Ok, can we use the same logo as the Saints Row games? Volition, you seem to be having trouble grasping this moving on concept. Come up with a new theme. What's another thing you're interested in? Uh, we quite like Saturday morning cartoons. Of course you fucking do. And so we have Agents of Mayhem, a cross between Saints Row and G.I. Joe. A Saints Joe, if you will. Nintendo, what the steaming cross-eyed fuck is this? I'm still trying to get my head around it. A crossover between Mario and Raving Rabbids using turn-based XCOM-style combat? What is this, a fucking Mad Lib? Or did someone lose a bet? If only you'd won the beer pong tournament at the last game dev party, Sony would have had to develop a city management sim starring Crash Bandicoot and Pyramid Head. Look, I'm not ragging on you for doing something unexpected, I applaud that. If you only ever gave people what they asked for, every game would be an identical fucking multiplayer hero shooter with a range of unlockable nipple tassels. But when you set out to partner up with Ubisoft, was Raving Rabbids honestly the best option to cross over with Mario? I mean, the Assassin's Creed series is also frequently based around jumping on people and already has a bunch of comedy Italians in it. Tell me you couldn't picture it, Mario in a little assassin robe, jamming a wrist spike into an unsuspecting Cooper Trooper to make coins fly out. My point is, when was the last time Raving Rabbids was raving relevant? I'm on the record as enjoying XCOM combat and by the end of this sentence we'll be on the record as not enjoying this very much. The difficulty gets annoying after a while, possibly because we unlock new better weapon upgrades with each victory but I couldn't always afford them, so there's a subtle obligation to grind, as well as some very unsubtle ones, like when your part is blocked by a huge sexually aggressive panda and the game goes, whoops, you'd better replay this level after you unlock the Chinese zookeeper's wanking gloves. But let's not preemptively write off Destiny 2, like a prom date who picks us up on a riding lawnmower. Besides, it's either this or Knack 2, or asphyxiating myself to death in my car, and since the neighbour borrowed the hose pipe, I'm stuck with this. Still, at least the scenery's nice. In fact, that brings me to a strange epiphany that struck me while I was playing the game that I'd like to share with you now. It was while I was following a series of objective markers in order to get to a place wherein might be found some lads to shoot, I paused about halfway down a corridor to take a break from the sheer roller coaster of excitement the mission was turning into, and found myself staring at the wall texture. We were in one of the several hundred ancient alien temples covered in somehow still functioning LEDs that Bungie have made across their career, and the decor had gone for an intricate pattern of narrow lines and right angles, but then I looked closer and saw there were multiple layers of lines, some in sharper relief than others. I got curious and looked around the entire surrounding area for where the pattern repeated, and I couldn't find it. Every part of the wall seemed to be a unique combination of lines and little glowy lights. Who were you, mysterious wall texture designer person, with whom I feel a strange kinship as I gaze upon your work? What ambition spurred you through the years of practice and higher education that brought you to this place? When you dreamed of your artwork being hung up on walls to be viewed by millions, is this precisely what you had in mind? I pictured them heading back to their cubicle to touch up another series of functionally identical but slightly varied wall textures, and passing a meeting room where they overhear some designers discussing how best to word the latest iteration of going to a place and shooting some lads, whereupon they heave a weary sigh and add another few names to the workplace massacre checklist they know damn well they no longer have the balls to execute. Are you sure there isn't something else about Destiny 2? you'd like to talk about yards, like say the PvP, or the level design, or the fact that the three different categories of weapons are now called something different to what they were called last time. No! I want to talk about how I stared at a wall for five minutes and it was somehow the most interesting part of the game. I'm starting a new wave of game criticism right here. It's called Up Yours Publishers. Now I've never played Metroid 2 for the GameCube, so I can't tell you how accurate a remake this is, but if that factor is important enough to be a deal breaker for you, then please suck on an exhaust pipe and remove your lazy nostalgia-centric pollution from the cultural gene pool. I think the worst thing I can say about Metroid Samus Returns is that now I've played it, I will 
will almost certainly never play or think about it again. Not that it was bad, it just went into my brain space, my brain space said, yep, that's a Metroid game, alright, and then kicked it straight out the exhaust pipe. I suppose it's a question of what you'd rather have been in high school, the kid no one noticed, or the kid who tried to castrate themselves with a belt sander. Do you mind not getting invited to parties, or can you accept that every time you show up someone's going to hum the opening riff to enter Sandman? You remember Knack One, it was a launch title for the newborn PS4, for it is just as true in the games industry that newborns come into the world covered in blood and shit and scraps of tortured uterus. At the time I summed up my opinion with the phrase, Knack is cack, but honestly it was what you'd expect of a launch title. The launch title's job is basically to use the graphics hardware to erect a big glittering neon sign saying, your game here. Just something that looks halfway decent and has some basically functional gameplay that isn't going to blow any minds, something that will look glittery for the dumb dumb masses who have grown bored of staring at their jangling keys, but also doesn't scare them off and provides a nice low bar for developers to top as they get to grips with the hardware. It's like how you want the opening act to be someone competent enough to warm up the crowd, but not so good that they overshadow the main event. With that in mind, bringing out a sequel to a launch title four years down the line that isn't much different to the first is like bringing the opening act on again to play the fucking encore while the main band hide backstage, crying and gorging on wagon wheels. Yes, Knack was cack, but Knack 2 is cack poo. But the niceties of the gameplay hardly matter since Knack's non-presence as a character in the plot creates this profound gameplay and story disconnect. That means I gave so little shit about what happened that were I to review Knack 2 I'd probably very abruptly give up halfway and start talking about a completely different game. Steam World Dig 2 is the slightly awkwardly titled sequel to Steam World Dig. Viewers, do you think there's something wrong with me? Rhetorical question, hands down please. It can seem very unfair that you've worked so hard to memorise the best way to avoid the first two stages attacks, only for them to be replaced by completely different attacks that you must now figure out in your estimated 12 nanoseconds of remaining life will start all over again. The music's pissing you off and your eyes hurt and that fucking pirate has twice as much health as every other boss, I fucking swear, and you're pretty sure you're going to write down some very harsh swear words when you come to do the review, but then all of a sudden you enter a sort of cosmic state of hyper-awareness and beat the boss perfectly, and it's like someone's lifted a whale off your lower back and you just feel serene, until the game grades you with a C-, minus. but honestly stick your grades up your ass, Cuphead. I'm happy, and I won't have to beat my kids tonight. It's like being stabbed to death by Dick Van Dyke. Yes, it hurts, and it's probably not good for you, but you can't stay mad. It's too adorable how he thinks he can do a Cockney accent. Okay, Arts, you can do this one more week before the big releases start, and then you can stop pretending anyone gives a shit about indie games. Oh, hello there, viewers! I noticed that Steam has had another bountiful week of dry looking strategy games and upbeat cartoon pornography. Let's look at a couple of games that were neither of those things and so leapt out at me like a half killed grasshopper from the mouth of an unwarrantedly self satisfied cat. A Hat in Time is about a rather alarmingly unsupervised little girl in a series of hats exploring a fantastic world of adventure to find fuel for her spaceship. Since she starts the game in bed, probably safe to assume this is all a dream, or perhaps that she's descending into fantasy in the last few moments of brain activity before dying of starvation or neglect in a forgotten hospital basement. The first obvious comparison between Hob and A Hat in Time is that both of them seem to treat standard combat like some unwanted dullard colleague who reliably brings the mood down at every fucking office party but they have to keep him around because he knows the Wi-Fi password. Oh yeah, by the way, Shelob is a pretty lady now. You might think you know differently if you've read the books or seen the films where she had more of a rampaging giant spider thing going on, but don't be such a prig. She's still a giant spider, but now she can be a pretty lady as well, okay? Who can see the future and forges uneasy alliances with passing half-ghost grizzly swordsmen in order to clandestinely pull strings in pursuit of some unknowable long-term goal. Yeah, that grand strategic cunning was really coming across in The Return of the King, when she was screechingly chasing after some hobbits in a cave, when she was having trouble chowing down on the fat one because he hit upon the equally cunning strategy of getting out of the way. Having said that, the main story has a couple of neat twists that I won't spoil, not that you care, do you? What you really want to hear about are the fucking micropayments, and if they mean we should string some or all of the Warner Brothers up over a penful of hungry dogs with a big in strip lodged between each toe. Of course, the publishers have been quick to tell us that you don't need them to beat the game, and you can certainly get through the main story without them. Whoop de fucking do, publishers. An owl in a body cast could get through story missions. Oh, it's all optional, yards. But what the fuck does optional mean? It's video games. Playing them at all is optional. Sticking a broom handle up your ass is optional. Doesn't mean I wouldn't really like to do it. Let's see if it does any better with the Evil Within 2. Still a bit of evil in there, better run it through the dishwasher again. Things do seem a touch more focused right off the bat, because the plot zeroes in on the main character, Sebastian in Caster Watts it and his tragic backstory that the first game only briefly explored. Ha ha! Actually, I was lying there, I don't remember the first game exploring his tragic backstory much at all, but you believed me when I said it did, didn't ya? Shows how fucking generic, a gritty, cynical, burnt-out detective protagonist he is. I said he's got a tragic backstory and you all went, pfft, well, obviously. First you find a smashed together from Bodies boss, with a bit of that Japanese ghost thing going on where they're one change of lighting away from being in the shampoo advert, so that's the baseline, that's pH neutral, but then you fight a bloke in a blue suit. After that, the next main villain's boss fight is just a sample platter of bosses from the last game, which is cheating, so no points there. And finally, giant angry corpse. Still, what could you expect? The virtual world gave them an excuse for literally infinite creativity, and all they made was a bog standard Midwestern town. Bad enough to make a corporation's evil without being boring as well. Ooh, no, we can't make all the buildings out of gingerbread. What would market research say? They'd say, chomp, chomp, yum, yum. Super Mario Odyssey is a new Mario Gammon soiree, and I guess we know what that means. Nintendo are turning a profit this year. Yes! I know some Japanese salarymen who'll be drinking irresponsibly tonight. All of them, as usual, but that's besides the point. You see, the plot is driven by 
by Bowser travelling the world gathering the essentials for his fairy tale wedding ceremony, which is very adorable. Bowser's a properly raised fire-breathing lizard tyrant, he's not gonna father a bastard rape baby. How would he explain that to his parents? This is the same silly world that's populated with realistically proportioned humans, by the way, which for me raises the question of what the fuck Mario is, if not a human like these lads. Some frighteningly malformed species of hairy pygmy? It's one of the things that underline how Mario is now essentially just a brand with no consistent tone that can be put alongside literally anything without a blink. See also the realistic dinosaur we possess in the first world for all of two minutes, I suspect, just so they could put it in the fucking trailer. And a strange interlude late in the game wherein Bowser shows up riding a fucking Dark Souls boss. I guess it's not really a complaint, it's just not fair on other games that work jolly hard to keep a consistent visual tone. You wouldn't see Dark Souls introduce cartoon mushroom people out of nowhere. <coughs> moving on. So if you've played Mario Galaxy you should settle back in quick, and you'll be relieved to know that you no longer have to shake a Wiimote to attack like you're trying to give yourself tendinitis. Not that Nintendo have entirely undug their heels from the motion controls filth. Hey, don't forget you can shake the controller to climb poles a bit faster and throw your hat a bit differently and various other non-essential things. I hadn't forgotten, thanks Nintendo. You're gonna do it then, hadn't planned to Nintendo. Okay, I'll just remind you again next time you fucking blink. So someone on the dev team must have said, how do we follow a game like New Order? And someone else said, well I think the most important thing is that it not look like we're trying too hard. And they certainly pulled that off like superstars. I might almost have thought they weren't fucking trying at all. You remember how at one point in the last game we had to go to a Nazi moon base and it was like the ultimate escalation of ridiculousness and you wondered how you could possibly top that? Well in the new Colossus we get to go to a Nazi base on Venus, which is totally different to a moon base in a number of ways that I'm sure Bethesda will be happy to list for you if you all ring them up at three in the morning. Assassin's Creed is a once interesting historical adventure series that became part of the collective Ubisoft sandbox, a sort of amorphous blob of mediocrity that comes around to haunt us every year or so, like a monster from a lower rent Stephen King book. It went on a bit of a hiatus to see if it could find a way to recapture the magic, and after two years of thinking very hard, this is what they've come up with, a prequel with the subtitle Origins. Whoever's job it is to prevent the Ubisoft creative team from committing mass suicide, they cannot possibly be getting paid enough. I was about to make some joke along the lines of when can we expect Assassin's Creed Reloaded and Assassin's Creed Revelations, because I genuinely forgot they'd already done that one. As I say, the plot almost feels like an afterthought. We are Bayek of Siwa, an ancient Egyptian policeman type thing, who's very cross because his spin the wheel of motivation son was killed by proto-Templars, and also because his people are being oppressed, for which one he's the most cross about varies depending on what the current mission needs him to do. And now a list of things I liked about Sack of Greasy Oranges. Don't worry, it's brief. Scenery is nice. Um, removing the minimap and getting by on scouting with the eagle works pretty well, although it does make it way too easy to mark targets. And even without the minimap, the quantifying of everything means the screen's still sprinkled in bullshit. Oh, how embarrassing! This list of things I like has somehow turned into more gripes. Look, I'm not mad at you, Assassin's Creed Origins, I'm just disappointed. And bored. Sonic Mania must have brought with it a terrible moment of crisis for Sonic Team. Oh shit, someone put out a half decent Sonic game, cried a member of Sonic Team, urgently withdrawing their finger from their nose with a wet plop. We've been trying to slowly and painfully euthanize this franchise for years, and this might turn things around at a stroke. What if another generation? of creepy shut-ins turn into Sonic fans, flooding Deviant out with poorly drawn pictures of their original characters and molesting the family pets. Worse yet, what if people start holding Sonic games to actual standards again and we have to put some bloody work in? It won't come to that, cries another Sonic team member, dynamically standing to reveal their fully laden nappy. I'll tell you what we're gonna do, we're gonna pull out all the stops for Sonic Forces, we're gonna make a terrible 3D Sonic game to beat all terrible 3D Sonic games, we're gonna showcase everything we've learned over the last two decades of terrible 3D Sonic games, which is to say absolutely bugger all. No one's gonna be able to so much as think about molesting family pets because they'll be too busy thinking thinking about how bad Sonic Forces is, and whatever Sonic game comes after it will be lauded with praise if it so much as manages to shit on the kitchen floor instead of the carpet. The world is grateful for your sacrifice, Sonic Team. Sonic Forces gargles so much spunk that every parasitic microbe that dwells in its rotten teeth has gotten pregnant with a little turd baby. Remember back in the arcade heyday when video games were nice innocent things that just wanted to ruthlessly drain the pocket money from children with no more reward promised than the chance to put a three-letter swear word on the high score table? How things have changed! Star Wars Battlefront 2 took one too many trips to the cookie jar and now they've spoiled it for all the other kids. EA if you were hurting for money that bad, there were less obvious, more dignified ways you could have gotten it, such as, for example, going into a Disney board meeting wearing a Chewbacca mask and eagerly sucking them all off while their friends throw bloodstained money. But believe it or not, I don't want to dwell on the prevailing loot box controversy because it's been covered to death elsewhere and I'm not a multiplayer guy. I was more pissed off about EA selling Battlefront 1 at full price with no single player campaign and then sticking one in a second, equally full price game and expecting forgiveness. But then this is an increasingly popular strategy, isn't it? If you've done something shitty, follow it up with an even shittier thing and the first shitty thing will be swiftly forgotten and normalised. Take EA's advice. If you get caught cheating with your wife's sister, double down and fuck her guinea pig as well. Gameplay is, in short, an unexciting grab bag of standard elements, broken up by the odd vehicle section, which is the opportunity to add some of that authentic Star Wars flavour, so of course you pilot X-Wings and Y-Wings, and possibly some other wings that aren't named after chromosomes in frankly insultingly easy flight combat missions. And then there's ground vehicles, but I wonder if the need for authenticity could take a backseat to gameplay once in a while, because I really don't see how anyone could look at an AT-AT walker lumbering along like a rhino in high heels, shooting once per half hour, getting dunked on by whippy little rebel ships that can actually turn around inside a 
a week and think, wow, piloting one of those must be fun. Could probably get my novel finished at last. You haven't reviewed COD World War II yet, Yards. Oh, but I have, viewer. I've reviewed COD World War II more times than I can count. Sometimes it's called Call of Duty, sometimes it's called Battlefield, sometimes it's called Medal of Honor, but it is always nonetheless the same. A lot of Nazis will die and we'll all learn important lessons about duty and brotherhood before we join the multiplayer and listen to a bunch of grown men calling each other faggots for stealing their kills, while the publisher tries to tacitly convince us to blow our life savings on premium VD medicine. Besides, going back to World War II is a shamelessly retrograde move that I don't want to encourage because next platform shoes might come back. So another year is lolloping to a close like a walrus rolling inexorably down a hill towards a threshing machine and there's only one week left for catch-ups before the end of year festivities. But what, of all the games I never got around to in 2017, most deserves a last minute second look? Some indie darling, something that proved influential in retrospect like Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, or perhaps a game where one of the goals is to find all of the toilets and deposit in each one a big smelly farty poo. I think we all know the answer to that one, so yeah, South Park the Fractured But Whole. There's actually a clever joke in that subtitle, did you spot it? Fractured But Whole? That's right, you can't have something fractured and whole at the same time! Oh, the mind-bending feats of wordplay of those clever young whippersnappers who make South Park. Clever middle-aged whippersnappers, rather. Middle-aged whippersnappers still making a living out of poo jokes. My goodness, my glass house is sparkling delightfully in the morning sun. What a nice day to indulge in my favourite hobby of projectile mineralogy. Well, there's quite a sumptuous bounty of features that Fractured But Whole doesn't have anymore. Equipment, equipment upgrades, perks, all coming soon to a landfill near you. What you get is, you pick a character class, your class gets three attacks and a super attack and that's your lot. How your character improves is that every few levels you unlock a new slot into which special patches can be placed, which is a surprisingly deep system and requires quite a bit of thought, but here's a brief beginner's tutorial. If you see a patch with a number on it that's higher than the patch you've currently got, equip that patch instead. Now for the advanced lesson, once you've unlocked two patch slots, equip the patch with the second highest number on it. If you're having trouble figuring out how numbers work, try punching yourself in the balls the same number of times as each patch and then equip the patch that made your balls hurt the most. Close sarcasm quotes. So that's Fractured But Whole, it's stick of truth but not so much. Bit of a dowdy note to end the year on really, so here are some pictures of ladies' bottoms. But as always, we can't call it a year until 15 of the games I've reviewed have been arbitrarily compartmentalised for future reference by weirdos. Greetings, weirdos of the future. You must be feeling like you were born in the wrong era. If only I'd been around in 2017, you're thinking. I'd have been practically lionised for my inappropriate behaviour around women. Sorry to wound you, Volition, but be fair, you wounded me first. After the peerless Saints Row series, their next game was going to be one to watch, and while they clearly went into Agents of Mayhem full of energy and ideas, all they did to follow through on that was rotate their wrist for a while going It's Breath of the Wild. Yeah, fanboys, I'm putting it in at four. What are you going to do about it? You're going to cry? Ooh, mummy, call the police. He only moderately lavished it with praise. Bring me my coat that looks good from the back, because I'm going to do some serious shunning. Yeah, whatever. It's fine. Organic. Looks nice. Plays well, even if the protagonist could be out charismaed by his fucking horse. If I were giving out Lifetime Achievement Awards for blandness, Bioware would definitely be a hot contender. Bland, obvious settings where bland characters blandly goldfish stare their way through bland dialogue and occasionally blandly knob each other in a sequence designed by someone with very bland ideas about sex scenes who couldn't get a job at Cinemax. But I digress. More like Mass Effect Blandrometer, am I right? Naughty Yahtzee, this game came out last year. I know, but I reviewed it this year, versions of it came out this year, and I really want to give it one more kick in the baubles before the holidays are over. Dead Rising 4. A stripped down, tarted up, holiday special of a Dead Rising game with none of what makes Dead Rising good. Even alongside the mediocre Dead Rising 3, it resembles a dog turd in a bread bin. It was going to be this or Mario Odyssey, and giving it to Mario felt like writing a sports movie where the winner is the team that practiced more and had the most funding. Perhaps to be expected, but nonetheless unsatisfying. I don't love Mario like I love A Hat in Time. Mario merely meets expectations. A Hat in Time is a bit wobbly and not very long, but it's fresh, it's surprising, it's charming, and it did it without needing a room full of sweatshop workers filing every last imperfection off Princess Peach's left bum cheek. Don't think I'm supporting the view that your long-running series might come back around to being good if you just keep plodding along. Rather, I'm supporting burning your series to the ground on a regular basis to make snowmen with the ashes. Resident Evil 7 is a successful change of tune that also manages the balance between disturbing and knowingly camp that marks Resident Evil at its best. Well done, Capcom. Looking forward to seeing how you fuck it up this time. I know it's the loot box controversy that still haunts this game like the ghost of an albatross, but let's not forget it also had a single player campaign, an entirely obvious single player campaign composed from flakes of rust that peel off the grinding wheels of the corporate machine, every inch focus group to most efficiently trick the audience into finding the same nostalgic bullshit as always as valuable as new ideas. I'm not even gonna say the name, it knows what it did, but after righteous anger I want the worst game to be something so bad that I come back around to feeling positive about it, something so fucking pathetic all you can do is laugh. And for that, it's Sniper Ghost Warrior 3. Ugly, boring, badly optimised, and with a story straight from a 12 year old boy locked in the bathroom with a Tom Clancy themed pin up calendar and severe familial issues. Still, at least it has a positive message on diversity. There's a place in the games industry even for complete morons, and not just holding up the archery targets. And as with many polytheistic religions, the smallest amount of research into Shinto will make you wonder why Christianity has stuck around so long when all the other religions were clearly having much more fun. For example, did you know that Amaterasu, the sun goddess, fell out with Tsukiyomi, the moon god, after Tsukiyomi got grossed out by the goddess of food? 
food, literally pulling a feast out of her ass. So Akami is still highly regarded, but what you'll note about the rave reviews is that they always go off on one about the beautiful art and soundtrack, and don't seem to dwell much on how the game actually plays. Languid was a word that caught my eye from one review, which is about the nicest possible way of saying slow. It's not paced like a slug on wet concrete, it's languid. That wasn't premature ejaculation, that was biological time-saving. That's not a urine stain on my trousers, it's a moisture concentration zone. You may have noticed a rather glaring gap in my 2017 lineup of reviews. Oh really, Yards? You mean the game that's been the biggest seller on Steam for fucking months, the one that practically embodied the year itself because it's nihilistic, depressing, argumentative and full of loot boxes and wankers? Yes, I am of course referring to none other than Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. Haha, <laughs> big joke. When the winner is the last person to get shot, fall to their death or quit in disgust after listening to the voice chat. Because another thing PUBG could stand for is players unabashedly backing genocide. Seriously, the first thing I did was mute that shit because I started my first game and immediately heard someone going niggers, 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 and I know that sounds like something I'd make up, but I swear they were. Hell, who needs to interact with the other players anyway? I do usually avoid multiplayer games, after all I personally understate the benefits of gregariousness, but I'm fine as long as I don't have to socialise and we can just mutely exterminate each other like when I go to trivia night at the pub. I imagine my first experience with player unknown's buggery grind was pretty similar to most people's. I ran around in a seemingly empty landscape for a while, then something far in the distance made a coughing sound and my head exploded. Then I'd use the death cam and witness my death from the point of view of the fucking Terminator, who whipped around 180 degrees, instantly spotted me eight miles away and sniped me with a gun the size of an ironing board that he must have gotten from a downed alien spaceship. By these methods I was soon routinely surviving to the top ten, but wait a minute I thought as a protracted squatting session between two pews in a church rolled into its tenth minute, there's something missing from this essential gaming experience. Oh that's right, I'm not having any fucking fun. I knuckled down and church camped my way to my second loot box, dreaming of the next fancy cosmetic that would surely make me the belle of the morgue. And you know what I got? A pair of beige trousers. Great, this will be perfect camouflage if the next match takes place in an Ikea showroom. So I knuckled down again until I got my third loot box which contained a pair of white trousers. My fourth, which was about where I resolved to give up playing the loot box market, was, brace yourselves, a pair of black trousers. Well at least I assembled a complete spectrum of trousers, or to put that another way, I painstakingly united a britches gradient. So let's start with Fortnite Battle Royale with cheese. Player Unknown's Bobcat Goldthwaite is of course more popular than the last pair of socks at the wanking factory, and when something attains that level of success there have to be a few less well known alternatives so that hipsters can say that they're way better actually, but you wouldn't understand because you're a pleb. Also fuck traps. You can pick up an item that traps a section of floor, other players can't see it and it instantly kills them. That's not pitting skill against skill, that's just oh you walked into a room, well fuck you. That'll teach you to wipe your feet. Oh but it is early access so maybe they'll have changed that by next week or added a chocolate fountain, who the fuck knows. Having said that, I wouldn't recommend getting Dusk now, nor would I recommend any linear single player game going early access because it's just sacrificing the first impression. And after you've finished the two available chapters of The Promised Three, you'll be left blindly groping for a climax like there was a sudden power cut at the Backstreet Massage Parlour. Sort of underlines the inherent problem with reviewing early access games, but as a great YouTube channel once said, fuck you it's January. What else am I going to review? The smell of my dog's farts? Two stars, bold and earthy with subtle notes of toilet water. Okay, a little background, as my masseur said when they found clods of earth between my shoulder blades. A while back I wanted to make the point that there seemed to be an awful lot of anime dating sims sprouting up on Steam the way looters show up on a ruined battlefield, and I illustrated this point with a screenshot of the first one I saw on the listing which happened to be Doki Doki Literature Club. And the response in the comments was like I'd accidentally rested my beer on the gravestone of an abuse victim. Ho 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 ho! If only you knew what you'd done, sang my correspondence. What? What have I done? Oh, we can't tell you. You have to play it for your parody game, got it, don't care, and I get off my fucking lawn. Then I started noticing a couple of words floating around the Steam tags and the reviews, words like psychological horror and disturbing, and I was like, oh right, it's one of those Five Nights at Freddy's arrangements. Most reviews that I've read say at this point something like, ooh, I'm not gonna spoil what happens, you gotta see it for yourself, waggle waggle eyebrows, but fuck that, I've got points to make, so from now on there be spoilers. And you must make branching decisions to court one of the girls in the hope of helping her overcome her inevitable massive sexual repression and get some lovely kisses and or plough her up and down the garden path, depending on what specific kind of visual novel we're dealing with. The real turning point comes when the depressed girl commits suicide, that's the definite point of bollock descent into icy water. Although her depression had been portrayed with a slightly uncomfortable authenticity, so it wasn't creepy in an enjoyable psychological horror kind of way, it was just really fucking sad. Boy, says the character, sure hope you don't right click the game in the steam list, click properties, click browse local files, and then delete please delete this.txt, that'd be a pisser and no mistake. The Inpatient is a prequel of sorts to Intil Dawn, that branching path slasher movie game from a while back and so it takes a few moments to remind us at length that our choices will have consequences. For example, if we choose to get bored and stop playing, that will have the consequence of a slightly more enriching afternoon. It all culminates in the fantastic ending, where we get to the cable car to escape the mountain asylum and one character turns to whoever's turning into a Wendigo and goes, hey you're turning into a Wendigo. Yes, yeah, figured as much, bit of a pisser isn't it? Well how about all of us who are not Wendigos sit in the cable car and you can stay here and start it for us. Alright, fair enough. That was the fucking final boss, was it? 
the explosive climax that I walked slowly down a whole five or six corridors for. Eat shit, the inpatient. In fact, I think this is the first VR game I've played that's pulled off the high-octane shooty action and didn't even make me feel sick. It made my head hurt, but, you know, Mum always warned you that would happen if you sat too close to the TV, so what the fuck did you expect would result of strapping the TV to your fucking face? Doom VFR, possibly a leap forward for VR action games, the inpatient possibly a leap forward into a ditch full of very uninteresting rocks. A world of ancient beasts, great savage drooling creatures that normal men and women must find a way to work around if they ever hope to live in peace, but enough about the last time I visited my grandparents, let's talk about Monster Hunter World. Plot progression is less about the unfolding series of events and more about adding more shit to your to-do list. Oh boy, we unlocked a new area where there's a monster made of ready salted crisps. Guess I'm gonna have to hunt them like 15 times until I've got a sword made out of his dick and armour made out of his bum, because there's a lot of other monsters with a weakness for ready salted crisps. Another thing that took a while to click was the combat, which is where the game happily throws you in at the deep end by handing you a box full of 14 different weapons with distinct attack styles, and when you look up from the box to ask when the tutorial's going to start, you realise Monster Hunter has already fucked off to go lovingly render some juicy steaks or something, and you've been left to figure it out for yourself. For example, one of the early crafting items you need for the utterly vital repair tool is cave sulphur, which I just couldn't track down. Okay, said the wiki, you know that thing that you've been running into in caves that aggressively swims towards you and explodes and kills you dead? Well, cave sulphur is the thing that that thing was sitting on. Oh right, forgive me, I was kind of getting the impression that I wasn't welcome in that dude's house, rooting around in his toilet bowl. What about kyanite? Where do I find that? Oh yeah, search the entire fucking map for the one cave that keeps going down and down and down until you're in the planet's fucking molten core. It'll be a six-week expedition and you'll probably die, but if you pull it off you'll get a depth upgrade for your prawn suit, so chin up. Subnautica always found a way to worm back into my interest pipes. I told myself I wasn't going to stick around long enough to want to mess around with the base building element much. I'd just build one scanning room to show me where the nearest 7-Elevens are, and that needs power, so solar panel, but wait, what if I wake up in the middle of the night wanting a disgusting cupcake? Better have a biomatter reactor as well, and now we'll need a little terrarium to feed it with. This is taking a lot of stuff, better add some storage. Ooh, there's a volcanic vent down there. I could probably extend the base far enough to build a thermal reactor, and if we're doing that, might as well add some more rooms. Hey Yard, you still playing that game? Who dares trespass upon Fortress Ocelot Alpha? Kingdom Come Deliverance is a let's charitably call it brave attempt to create a highly realistic and historically accurate immersive RPG set in 15th century Bohemia, but forget all that, what the fuck would have been the problem with just calling it Kingdom Come? Why bolt meaningless fucking subtitle to the end except to add an unnecessary roundabout to the otherwise perfectly straight road of any spoken sentence containing the name? Yes, I've harped on this before, but if you're still showing the symptoms then keep taking your medicine, motherfucker. Kingdom Come by itself would have been a perfectly appropriate and snappy title, and what's more it would have emphasised the come part, which would have been fitting because that's what the game is covered in. Soon enough, his village and parents get smashed up for giggles and he must venture into the world, and this is where the whole deliverance subtitle becomes relevant because Henry's last job before shit went cloudwards was to deliver a sword to the local bigwig, and the first twenty odd hours of the main plot revolve around his struggle to recover the sword so he can finish delivering it. And everyone seems to realise how fucking stupid he's being about this, even the bigwig in question flat out says to him, Dude, I've got swords, I own a fucking castle, I could eat a sword a day from now till Michaelmas and never run dry, chill the fuck out. But I'm saying all these nice things so that I can get to the main gut punch of this review, which is that the combat is fucking terrible. I'd think of some clever, wordier way of putting that, but honestly I can't convey my feelings any better than by just saying that again in a weary, emphatic tone of voice. Fucking terrible! So bollocks to Kingdom Come, but I reserve the biggest and most suffocating bollocks for those twats I saw on the Steam discussion forums praising its obnoxious qualities and asking the devs not to change the save system because if they did then plebs might get into it. Fuck you, toffee nose PC Master Race shitheads. I wish I'd named you something else now, like the PC gaming dick slurp all-stars. Well, Konami certainly seemed to be in the doghouse still, going by the reaction to Metal Gear Survive when it first came out. A sort of collective, ooh look what the cat dragged in. Sure you can deign to hang out in video game land a moment longer. You wouldn't rather be making a fucking pachinko machine based on a property people used to like. Oh look over there, Konami, an attractive single Silent Hill game standing at the bar. Why don't you swagger over there, put your best game face on and fucking cancel it. So if you can disregard the motives with which the game was made, i.e. all the kids in the AAA club are making loads of money with their shitty Skinner Box live service games, let's stitch one of our own together from about 500 generic ideas that other games have done better, slap on the name of a franchise we haven't quite milked all the goodwill from yet, set up the micropayments and hook ourselves a couple of whales, then Metal Gear Survive reaches the dizzy heights of occasionally not boring. On today's episode of the Zero Punctuation Occasional Guide to Moments from Gaming History Least Likely to be Adapted into a Life-Affirming Coming-of-Age Drama, we turn to the subject of moral panics, and then we turn around again and do a big fart in moral panic's face. Over the years, controversy in video games have gone hand in hand, followed by tongue in mouth and then cock in bumhole, but they've only relatively recently gotten into valid, helpful controversies like publishers are running barely disguised casinos through legal loopholes in the hope of stealing all the money in the world so they can build a new solid gold planet from which to plot their conquest of the universe and the death of that meddling fool Flash Gordon. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas was the fifth GTA game, and in their drive to experiment with the GTA formula, developers Rockstar had absolutely riddled the fucking thing with stat grinding mini games that had all the entertainment value of a large bag of polystyrene packing material, and in the spirit of grinding, waggle eyebrows, someone made a mod for the PC version of the game that replaced the slightly weak source fade out fade up implied boffing session that ended the dating side quests with a full on graphic sex mini game in which two fully clothed models made honks and squeaks of pleasure as they slide in and out of each other like a pair of butchered horse carcasses in a dog food processing vat. Notorious anti-video game lawyer and humanity's answer to the 
Sarcoptes parasites, Jack Thompson, jumped all over it, which was par for the cause at the time, but none other than Hillary Clinton also joined in for the kicking, just in case you thought the only mark against her was being unable to win an election against a large pile of cheesy watsits in an ill-fitting suit. Who ultimately was hurt by hot coffee and benefited from Rockstar's chastisement? Well, we don't need to speculate, we have stats. In 2007, the class action lawsuit was settled and Take-Two agreed to pay every offended customer enough money to buy a slap-up McDonald's meal for one. But as of June 2008, less than 2,700 people had made a claim. Oh, how shocking, said the 11 law firms that have been drawing the case out. Guess people just aren't as committed to taking a moral stand as they used to be. Gosh, is that the time on my suspiciously expensive Rolex got a run? So yeah, if you want to know why moral panics drag on, it's because somewhere, somehow, a shadowy cunt is making shitloads of money from it. Basically the same reason there's still a DC cinematic universe. With the epic and scintillating story of Half-Life that we all spend 15 years getting invested in now it seems resigned to end on an unresolved cliffhanger, fans of Half-Life may now turn to drastic means for the sake of some kind of closure. Fan fiction, cosplay, allowing Valve to essentially monopolise digital distribution for PC games. Some of them might even do something as drastic and self-destructive as pay actual money for Hunt Down the Freeman. Hunt Down the Freeman is also weirdly plot-heavy, interrupting its shitty levels regularly for elaborate source filmmaker cutscenes, starring multiple intense soldier dudes who all look like they were created in the Mass Effect character customization screen with about 90% of the options removed, and sound like they had that usual mod problem where every character has different audio quality, because the actors were recording with their personal headset mics they more commonly used to swear at 12-year-olds in Counter-Strike. Mitchell gets embroiled in the seven-hour war against the Combine, bridging the plot of Half-Life 1 and 2, just in case this didn't sound unmitigatedly galling enough yet, and what follows is a showcase of some of the worst level design ever commercially sold. And in that I include every shitty asset flip Steam game consisting of one flat square of grass texture with some trees dotted around it, because in this case someone was actually trying. You also need to use a mantling ability that only bloody works if you've holstered your bloody guns. Unfortunately the game forgot to bind a key to holster guns, and even after I bloody did it didn't bloody work, so I had to bloody no-clip through the problem. Twenty years ago, Half-Life was a focal point in gaming's ongoing development as an artistic narrative medium. The next few years saw a slew of titles that combined AAA game design with genuine emotional story. But what happened between then and now? Why are the games routinely rewarded with AAA status and income exclusively loot box infested live service bullshit, games designed not to inspire or stimulate our emotions but to numb them, and hypnotizers into lab rats mindlessly pawing the button that makes treats come out, while the games created with love and artistic integrity drown beneath waves of bottom feeders like Hunt Down the Freeman that tear chunks of rotten flesh from the corpses of Valve's children as Valve itself, once habitual founders of new ages of narrative gaming, merely waves them on, barely glancing up from their tax paperwork. What happened to you? What happened to us? To the people we were supposed to become? I don't know, but it's probably safe to blame John Romero. A Way Out is a new game by the dude who'd made Brothers build as an EA original, which is a classic oxymoron and is equally oxymoronically a linear narrative-focused multiplayer-only game. Let me talk you through my thought process when it was first pitched at me. It went something like this. Uh, mm, mm, e, mm, uh, but, mm, hmm. but this was also the point where we started actually role-playing. As I dutifully searched the house for fresh clothing and car keys, I'd pass my partner in the hall trying on hats or bumming the dog and I'd roll my eyes like their passive-aggressive spouse. Also Leo can draw a little moustache on a painting which Vincent can then wipe off. And this sticks out in my mind because it's pretty much the only moment when the main characters, or indeed any character, display an ounce of personality. So in the final act, Leo and Vincent are seeking revenge on a crime lord and torture one of his lackeys for information, a scene which could have been harrowing but they go about the torture like a pair of substitute woodwork teachers, and are informed that the crime lord is in Mexico. Go. Apparently that's enough to go on. All of Mexico? He must be very fat. Here's a quote for your blurb, a way out. All the death-defying excitement of failing to acknowledge a new haircut. But since I guess we're hacking out the usual thing, charismatic villain with army of followers takes over small helpless isolated nation and has to be opposed by a gormless tit with untapped survival skills they developed from routinely leaving all their gift shopping to the last weekend before Christmas, but where to choose for a setting? What part of the world could audiences credibly believe would allow itself to be taken over and isolated by a charismatic psycho with inexplicable legions of mindless followers and which furthermore has a greater death density of firearms than it has effective social services. Hmm, I wonder. Thank you, Yards, I think everyone's gotten the joke. Oh hello, rural America, didn't see you there, hiding under Canada's frilly miniskirt. While Far Cry 5 has much of what should now be expected from the Ubisoft sandbox, a phrase that for me must now be said with the same tone as the rape of Nanking, liberate the outposts, stop the convoys, find collectibles, stare at people till little icons appear over their heads like fairies on Christmas trees. Now I wasn't sure I was going to do this game, because you know what I'm like with JRPGs that aren't called Earthbound or Persona 5, I'll be rolling my eyes dismissively at the first sign of hairdos that look like they were crafted out of brightly coloured mashed potato by an extremely bored child who can't leave the table. But precisely 30 seconds into the plot, I had a feeling I was going to have to talk about this one, firstly in a review, and then maybe at some kind of inquest into what the fuck Japan has been playing at for the last 30 years or so. So here's how the story starts. The President of the United States is on his way to a summit of the UN when the city he's driving through gets hit by a direct nuclear strike. Don't worry, you didn't just turn over two pages at once, this is still Nino Kuni 2. Moments before death, the President is transported to a fantasy world, specifically to the bedchamber of a little prince boy wearing cat ears. Well that's one explanation anyway, but maybe you should save it for the 
hearing, Mr. President. Attack on Titan 2 is based on the anime of the same name, in which the inevitable cast of highly emotional 14-year-olds use repurposed extreme sports equipment to fight an invading force of the eponymous Titans, which are a pretty effective fucking nightmarish design, looking like humans with weird proportions and big smiles, like someone brought to life all the hideous monstrosities we've ever made in RPG character customization screens as a joke. Their brazen nakedness also acts upon primal fear dredged up from that time in your childhood when you saw your dad stand up in the bath. Whoops, I hear the enchanting sound of freshly disembodied giblets raining upon the roof. I think we're getting a visit from that lovable nutter Kratos, video gaming's favourite god botherer stroke god pulveriser. But then we start God of War 4 and it's like our crazy alcoholic friend showed up to the party and quietly asks for a mineral water because he found religion in prison. You want to go out and murder some people who mostly don't deserve it, Kratos, mate? No, I have to set an example for the kid now. I say the game starts this way, but really the game starts about six times. After the funeral, Kratos takes his little cum sprout hunting and then the game finally starts when a troll shows up and the combat kicks in, but after we formally introduce him to the inside of his chest cavity, we just go back to bed. Finally, the game actually starts when an introductory boss appears, or at least after we kill him and set off on the big journey. Then we play through some linear levels for a while before we unlock the boat and the world opens up and the game can truly begin. Right after you get to Tyr's Temple and unlock the Nine Realms, anyway. This is like listening to a story being told by a very old person and waiting for them to get to the fucking point, eventually realising there might never have been one in the first place. In fact, despite the game constantly banging on about Odin and what a violent, paranoid fuckface he is, he never fucking shows up. And what I assumed at the time had been a rather bland and heavily scripted boss fight as a prelude to the final chapter of the game ended up being the final boss. And then at the very very end, the game does a very cheeky thing by setting up an explosive climactic battle and then going, whoops, here we go again, freeze frame, roll credits like it's fucking happy days. But I can't help thinking of it as yet another classic series sacrificing some of its unique identity for the sake of making itself more like the standard AAA game of today. Grindy side quests, item crafting and standard camera bum hugging instead of the arty fixed camera angles overseeing combat like watching a lawnmower blade inside an overheating tumble dryer. Younger Kratos was never relatable but he was pretty fucking interesting to watch when he had a narc on and two fistfuls of Cyclops nutsack. Serious hairy dad Kratos is more human but also boring, stuffy and aloof. Yeah, Kratos really seems like a guy concerned with maintaining his dignity. That's why he coloured in his face with red biro and put on a cheerleading skirt. Well anyway, let's play Yakuza 6. Hopefully there won't be so many poignant lessons about fatherhood in a game centred around stoving faces in with other people's bicycles. Oh for fuck's sake, there's a baby! There's a massively convoluted plot to take over Japan that Kazuma Kiryu discovers and foils basically by accident during a personal investigation he started pursuing after he got really cross about a beautiful innocent lady being dishonoured. And the story is told through a series of prolonged scenes of very serious faced men staring at each other saying ominous things until they get bored and start hitting each other with bikes. There's one particularly hilarious scene where one dude starts splashing gasoline around and the other dude just continues to sit angrily staring at him because it's literally the only way anyone in these games knows how to deal with situations. Maybe the match will go out if I scowl slightly harder at it. Look, I'm gonna spoil every fucking Yakuza game's main plot now. Early in the game there'll be a scene where you have a growly voice angry stare sit down meeting with someone important that doesn't end in a fist fight. Someone in that meeting is the main villain. Probably someone shifty looking off to the side. At the end of the game, after the bit where everyone puts on dark suits and walks slowly down the street as the weird unfucking around music plays like we're going to a West Side Story themed funeral, they'll be the one who pulls their breakaway suit jacket off to reveal their torsos built like a fucking double decker bus with the Chronicles of Narnia poster on the back. One highlight for me this time around was the sexy internet chat room minigame where a live action video of a sexy lady plays as we have to complete a series of button prompts to type phrases like YOU ARE SEXY LADY and mmm LOVELY BOOBS in all caps. And I think what really made this for me was the image of Kazuma Kiryu typing in the bottom left, still wearing the furious scowl he uses to confront dastardly villains, but one can learn a hell of a lot more from failure than from success. As I frequently establish, this industry never learns anything, tee hee hee, because it's always so quick to reboot franchises and eschew backwards compatibility in an attempt to forget its failures. But if failure is how we get better, then there are some publishers that if they embrace their failures would be wielding the fucking Infinity Gauntlet by now. Unrelatedly, let's talk about Konami. More specifically, let's talk about Silent Hill 4. The premise is, Henry Townsend, a man resembling a Thunderbirds puppet wearing denim pyjamas, is renting a nicely fitted if slightly washed out apartment and wakes up one morning to find the door chained shut from the inside. A few days of sucking on the radiator for hydration later, a hole appears in his bathroom wall, leading to a series of bizarre nightmare worlds where he keeps witnessing people get murdered who then turn up dead in real life. The reason for it all probably loses something without context, but to give you the quick cheat sheet version, it's because a deranged ghost murderer thinks that Henry's apartment is his mum. And let's just say he ain't chuffed with his new stepdad. Make a stone pickaxe, one bit of wood, five rocks, gotcha. Make a bedroll, one bit of wood, five leaves, that's done. Now make a wooden storage box, 100 bits of wood, whoa 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 whoa, that was a fucking jump. I only wanted a footlocker, not a fucking regency wardrobe with complimentary portal to Narnia. Now let's build a tannery, that'll be 240 rocks. What? It's like three bits of wood with skin stretched over it, what are the rocks for? You're gonna put it on a gravel driveway? Look, we're just making sure you get the full intended experience, that is to say wasting hours of your life banging a rock with another smaller pointier bit of rock. Alright Steam, stop kicking that visual novel developer in the stomach for a second so I can see what's on your top setters list. Well, you know what all the kids have been talking about this week? House Flipper. 
Hmm, intriguing. Just one question. Are you taking the piss? I think we could have done with a bit more gameplay structure. A win state, like, say, earning enough to buy Disneyland and sell it to the Russian Mafia. Thank you for your assessment, Yahtzee. Now please supply an explanation and apology for reviewing House Motherfucking Flipper. Ah, I got no excuse. And the thread of games about working a repetitive job leads us loosely to our second game, Far <laughs> Lone Sales, which is a narrative indie game from the post-9-11 politics school of game design, i.e. keep moving right until you can't anymore. <laughs> Maybe the attempt at a thoughtful, understated tone doesn't match the inherent concept of piloting a fuck-off giant roadster that wouldn't have looked too out of place with Mad Max hanging off the front, looking like he's undergoing a wasteland teeth whitening procedure. The sort of thing I'd want to push up the top speed and then ride on top of going clang 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 goes the trolley, ring 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 goes the bell, crunch 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 go the bones of old people not getting out of the way. Oh boy, a new game by David Kide. Let's get the bingo card out. Ooh, a game about androids with only vague ideas of how to act like human beings. Finally David Cage is writing what he knows, lol. In all seriousness, while David Cage games are universally horribly written, cringeworthy of suspect values mired with gameplay akin to trying to watch a movie while fighting to get the remote away from an overexcited dog, they... Um, hang on, it's coming to me. Oh yeah, they're usually good for a laugh. Although the biggest one I got from Detroit <laughs> Become Human was right at the end when there was a little survey to get my impressions on the game, and one of the questions was, were there any points when you were personally touched by the story? All the time? Most of the time? Some of the time? Or no? Obviously I answered no. And when I checked the global stats, 90% of those surveyed had also answered no. So congratulations, David Cage. Something in one of your games finally made me feel hope for the future of mankind. Half the characters in these games are like one-off villains from the Incredible Hulk TV series when they had to contrive an excuse for Bill Bixby to hulk out every episode, so they'd chuck a random inexplicable asshole into the room to smirkingly give him nipple cripples for literally no reason. So nothing has changed about the gameplay, once again the standard movement controls make our characters seem like they lost all sensation in their legs after a broom handle got shoved up their ass, and we either press the on-screen button prompts very slowly to perform utterly tedious household tasks that don't progress the plot at all, or we press the on-screen button prompts very very quickly during an action sequence. And of course some of the prompts are fucking six-axis motion control the button prompt equivalent of the short kid with the lazy eye and the weird smell who's convinced he's one of the gang. Does anyone still seriously think this shit is immersive? I'll tell you what isn't immersive, having to rise from my controller clutching slump on the couch so the game will finally register me thrusting the controller downwards. Well now that my main points are across, I'd like to close this review by discussing one of the plot twists. So now's the time to tuck live oysters into your eyelids if you don't want spoilers. Ready? Here we go. Remember that nanny bot who adopts the human child? Towards the end it turns out the child was also an android all along. Ooh, what a twist. An inadequately explored twist that adds nothing to the characters or story and may even be detrimental to it. I mean, can a robot mother truly love a human child was a question with some power to it in this context, but can a robot love another robot? Yes, they can. We know they can. We've seen like 12 of the buggers doing it already. It's just a twist for the sake of having a twist. In other words, it's a David Cage twist. Sounds like a dance, doesn't it? Hey everybody, do the David Cage twist! Walk stiffly round the room for ten minutes, then reach for the sky and fall flat on your face. So for all those reasons I played through Agony, and having done so I now see another advantage to it, the title is very easy to do a games journalism with. Agony, it certainly was. Mmm, <laughs> smug smug. Let's all stroke our chins about misogyny and then give excessive coverage to an indie game made by someone I know. Psychological horror to me means something with more of an understated creeping dread about it. More uh, than uh, and Agony is very much on the uh, side of things. Yeah, if I can transcribe that one, bitch! We're doing a stealth game, I always forget what that means. I guess it means that if you try to move quickly past the vagina face monster, then it hears you and bites your face off, but if you carefully move slowly past it, then it will also hear you and chew your throat out. Um, no, I think you're missing some of the basic principles there, Agony. Alright, now about those hiding places. I'm pretty sure I know how this works. You're running away from vagina mush, you quickly get into a hiding place, then vagina mush catches up, spots you instantly, and masticates your nipples off. Increase how long the player can hold their breath. Oh, there's a hold breath button, now I understand. I'm supposed to hold my breath as I move slowly past the vagina monsters so they won't- Oh, it's spotted me anyway, and gnawed my gonads off. Never mind. Gathering once again in single file to have a good old splurge to camera are the usual suspects. EA, Bethesda, Ubisoft, Sony, Nintendo, and what was your name again? Microsoft. 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 Oh yes, weren't you the guys who made that funny paperclip thing? EA started spooging first, a full three days early, with some more anthem footage to make my eyes glaze over faster and more efficiently than ever. Still looks like they mulched together Mass Effect, Destiny, Titanfall, and Horizon Zero Dawn and spread it over a garage floor with an uninteresting broom. Did you see that pulse-pounding combat in action, can't wait to point at an enemy, hold down the fire button and stand there picking at my itchy bum crack until the damage indicator stopped coming out. We did get to see an only slightly less uninformative, painfully scripted Rage 2 video that I would only call gameplay footage because suffocating yawn fest takes slightly longer to type, so someone at Bethesda must have said, we're making sequels to scrotum pulverizingly good doom and teabag squeezingly forgettable Rage, which one would people most want to hear about? Well I think that should be obvious. Haha, <laughs> yes I suppose it is. Oh fuck, now I'll look stupid if I ask again. We also very loudly and conspicuous 
obviously didn't learn much about Fallout 76, except that it's online focused, so we can reliably infer the rest from what we know is already popular and easy to rip off. So roll over and yap like little dogs at supper time, you uncritical, butthole relishing, close relative molesters. My goodness, Microsoft's conference showcased a lot of games. Cyberpunk 2077, Just Cause 4, Metro Exodus, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, wow, are those all Xbox exclusives, Microsoft? Um, no, none of those are. But you can play them on Xbox? Yes, Microsoft, we could, hypothetically, do that. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is apparently the game where we see Lara Croft become the Tomb Raider. Fuck you, Square Enix, that's what you said the last two times. She's been becoming the Tomb Raider for five fucking years! When is this whimpering cunt gonna get out of training bras? Ooh, and also Nintendo announced a new Smash Bro- Oh, oh, sorry, halfway through saying the title I suddenly stopped caring. But what made me choke on my sherbet was when the bloke narrating the gameplay video said, For the first time you will be able to choose between a male and female hero. You what? Am I on crazy pills? Assassin's Creed Syndicate did that! What is the fucking point of doing progressive and innovative things if you're just gonna pretend they didn't happen two games later and try to score innovation points a second time? It's not progressive if you're progressing to the place where we already fucking are, genius! <sighs> you know why I still do these rundowns every year, it's because gamers as consumers have conceded too much fucking ground, and what counts as acceptable standard business practice inches more and more toward Fort Bullshit Tennessee every year. Twenty years ago the relationship was, play one third of our game for free, as much as you like, and then consider paying this unworthy mortal twenty insignificant dollars for the rest, your grace. And somehow that's turned into, pay in full now, stinking plebs, because we showed you a logo. You can't have it for six months, and then you have to pay another ten bucks for the special helmet with a bell end on the front, so everyone knows what a cockhead you are. The push back against loot boxes was a good start, but how about this? Let's all stop pre-ordering stuff. Just for a year, six months maybe, trial period. If you're tempted, ask yourself, can I envision a scenario in which my decision to purchase this game might ultimately hinge on whether or not I can play it while wearing a special pre-order cock helmet? At least consider it, so that next year I'm not saying, hey guys, how about we all stop ticking the box that says Sony have the exclusive ownership rights to our blood? The protagonist is Jonathan Reed, a tall dark pasty bloke with a pointy beard whose transformation into a vampire therefore couldn't have come fast enough. Um, excuse me Yahtzee, they're called Econs. I beg your pardon. Econs. It's our special word for vampires. We made it up. I can fucking tell you did. Jonathan's a physician by trade and returns after the First World War to find London stricken by both the Spanish flu and a plague of ghouls who- not ghouls, Yahtzee, scowls. What's a fucking scowl? It's a human tainted by vampire blood. That's a ghoul! We call it a scowl! Tell me more about the city. Tell me more about your job. Tell me more about that thing you said about the city that I'm awkwardly bringing up again apropos of nothing. Tell me more about this weird boggle-eyed look we're giving each other like a pair of love-struck goldfish in neighbouring bowls. I've never met a dinosaur that a scientist hasn't tried to ruin. Jurassic Park comes out and everyone's enjoying the T-Rex and the Velociraptors, but then Johnny Scientist jumps up and goes, um, actually we did a little bit more science, and we've learned that Velociraptors were two foot tall and feathered and could be trained to fetch slippers. Also the T-Rex was more of a scavenger than a hunter, and all the other dinosaurs used to bully it and knock its school books out of its tiny pathetic arms. Carnivores are just complete pricks. That's another thing I had to learn early on. Don't put carnivores and herbivores in the same enclosure. Oh really, Yarts? Thanks for the insider tip. Don't forget to remind us not to mistake an orbital sander for a wanking sock. Alright, it seems obvious now. So at E3 everyone saw that Resident Evil 2 was getting remade and everyone hopped smartly onto their backs and began squeezing out great big fruity woofers to express their glee, but my woofers stayed resolutely where they were and yes it was actually very uncomfortable, because I'm aware that the Resident Evil series follows a pattern. They put out one good game and then they proceed to churn out inferior sequels until they can churn no more, making what was once a perfectly straightforward standalone horror plot into a nightmarishly convoluted mess of canon ever expanding like fresh vomit on a tile floor, making everyone in the room nauseous and creating vomity spin-offs to make the matter worse, until finally someone takes a self-awareness pill locks themselves in a vomit-proof basement and makes another good one, usually by stripping things down to core concepts and keeping the shit-smeared hippo of established canon out of its virgin waters. And then, the moment it does well, Capcom goes, phew, time to get back on track, and the shit-smeared hippo promptly belly flops straight back in to ruin things anew. It's not a constant barrage like your RE6 or your Dead Space, that's just mind-numbing. Downtime is used very effectively, but it can ramp up in a second. And like a well-written essay, this is summarised in the very first paragraph, when you arrive at the village and have to fend off an endless horde of smelly foreigners for a fixed amount of time. Maybe you'll survive until the bell rings and watch nonplussed as the entire horde fucks off for pancakes, or maybe you'll meet the bloke who came to the costume party as a potato who instantly chainsaws your fucking head off. Either way, you'll have come to appreciate the way RE4 goes from zero to a hundred and back again in an instant like a bipolar dad on a long car journey. So this week I have been mostly playing Totally Accurate Battlegrounds, which is actually a hilarious parody of Battle Royale shooters. What it does is, instead of dropping a hundred players onto a map full of randomly spawned equipment and gradually shrinking it until only one remains, it drops about fifty players onto a map full of randomly spawned equipment and gradually shrinks it until only one remains, and 
everyone's got googly eyes. Yeah, that's some astringent satire you've got going on there, totally accurate battlegrounds. Truly the spirit of Jonathan Swift lives on through thee. So all in all, we'll put TAB in the viable alternative category. It is a bit mired with bugs and cheaters, but they're diligently churning the patches out, which makes me wonder if any of the developers think that this has all gone a bit beyond a joke. Ha <laughs> ha, let's make a battle royale mode of our silly physics game for April Fools. It's not like we'll have to support it for the rest of our fucking lives. It's like they served a trick rubber steak to their house guests and the idiots won't stop trying to eat the fucking thing. Hey, I can't chew this steak. Yes, haha, <laughs> it's a rubber steak. April Fools. But I want to eat the steak. It smells of steak. Yes, we made it smell like steak because it needed to for the joke to work. I didn't expect you to get this into it. Ow, my stomach hurts after I ate the steak. Look, you weren't supposed to- Ugh, just- Fuck it, here's a real steak, all right? Have fun with it. Do I get a steak too? Can I have a slightly larger steak? Yes, fuck it, I'll cook steaks for everyone. This is my life now. I'm pretty sure if you travelled in a straight line northeast by east from Los Angeles in this game, you wouldn't run into anything of note until you hit St. Louis, and arguably not even then. The game is divided between four distinct types of driving gameplay. Pro racing, which involves driving to a place the fastest. Off-road racing, which involves driving to a place the fastest. Street racing, which involves driving to a place the fastest in a very irresponsible way. And freestyle, which involves doing stunts in a plane until you unlock the second tier, at which point it becomes about driving to a place the fastest. Is it worth speculating why Ubisoft went from in-depth plot to basically none? Was it a calculated move because nobody gave shit one about the plot of the first crew, or did Ubisoft use up all their budget and resources adding tits to one of Assassin's Creed Odyssey's protagonists? Whatever the case, a sequel having less stuff than the original is always a tough sell. It'd be like putting out a new smartphone without a headphone jack. If you just want a multi-terrain racer then there's one in here, sure enough, but you might wonder why it's spread out across a pointlessly large, empty, uninteresting sandbox. If you want that experience, then just play a, say, Mario Kart, with your accelerate and brake buttons on opposite sides of the room. Yes, it actually literally means eight parts in English. Gosh, you're so clever and worldly, Square Enix-san. It's like how any food sounds classier if you give it a French name. Mère de chien à la gravier probably sounds a lot more palatable than dog turds in gravel. After the first round of story chapters, I was about six below the recommended level for the next one, and thus did things get grindy. Once I'd fucking found somewhere to grind, of course, considering the game map refuses to tell you what level each area is suitable for. In retrospect, maybe I shouldn't have equipped that passive perk Cyrus had that reduced the number of random encounters. But it was his only perk at the time and it took ages to learn, so what was I supposed to do? Not equip it? That's like giving me a long cylindrical object and telling me not to stick it up me dog's bum. Observer is a game by Bloober Team. No, really, that's their name. Sounds to me like someone asked them their name before they'd come up with it and someone had to hastily make one up. What usually happens after you've widdly weed everything that can be widdly weed is that Rutger Hauer announces he's figured it out and the door to the next bit opens. Either that or there'll be a four digit code lock you need to figure out, but the game makes sure no one gets left behind. There is literally a moment where the numbers you need to figure out materialise before you in giant neon digits. Another time I was casually jacking off into the head of a dead young lady in a room with a conspicuous four digit code lock, and towards the end of the jack off sequence I see the same lady in the same room going 6105, 6105, 6105. So once I was back in reality I went back to the code lock flush with pride at my deductive reasoning skills, but before I could do anything Rutger Hauer went, I think the code might be 6105, what do you think electronic geniuses of the future? Let's start with Chasm. It's pixel art, it's procedural, it's metroidvania, and of course it's fucking kickstarted. Hey kickstarter backers, don't insulate the inside of that comfort zone too much, there'll be no room for your fat spotty ass. We are a rookie knight dispatched to an abandoned mining town to figure out what's gone wrong, and upon taking a look in the mine he goes, well there's your problem, you've got a metroidvania game down there. Five distinct zones opened up in stages by new abilities, boss fights, more backtracking than a mistakenly laid out railway, that's metroidvania alright. Hope you've been maintaining that safe point in your town square, cause this is gonna cost you, madam. Also Chasm is procedurally generated, or at least that's the claim, it seems like the boss fights, the warp rooms and the upgrades are all roughly in fixed order and it's just all the filler rooms in between that change, but I'm not even 100% on that. I started a second game with a new seed to see if I could figure out what had changed and discovered a short ways in that I didn't actually give a shit. Because the plot is about an inexperienced female deputy in a small town department having to take over when the sheriff is killed and who just can't seem to get respect in a man's world. Fortunately, her officer's arrest a drifter who turns out to be a former police chief wanted on federal corruption charges, but more importantly, he's a man, with a big manly beard. So she puts him in charge instead. Hey, this is the police too, did you see what I did there? I got the premise of your story across in about half a paragraph, perhaps you could show that to your cutscene writer the next time you get a word in edgeways. Yes, Titper has pretensions to cinematic storytelling, but, well, here's my impression of a this is the police 2 cutscene. I mean, I mean, this is me doing an impression of a this is the police 2 cutscene right now. I'm doing it now. Can't you see I'm doing an impression of a this is the police 2 cutscene, viewers? 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 Are you listening, viewers? You need to be listening to understand my impression of a this is the police 2 cutscene. But when I was picking my dudes for the second combat mission, the game went, oh, by the way, some of these officers hate you, and also being alive, so they're not going to do anything you tell them to do. Oh, could you point out in some obvious way which officers have this characteristic? No, now assemble your team. Sure enough, I inadvertently picked one of these loose cannon dudes who immediately ran off, shot the first bad guy they saw, and 
and caused the nearby building to disgorge about 20 gang members like a drug fueled clown car, and all my dudes got dead. And that's when I decided I'd had enough of Tit Put 2. It's one thing to bore my tits off, it's quite another to then kick my tits around the garden with a gameplay system I'd usually kinda enjoy. Feels like a betrayal, like getting cut off in traffic by a character from Sesame Street. I've just had this really crazy idea, guys. How about, instead of procedurally generating an open world, because every game has to have one and you need to keep up, you just restrict the gameplay to the important fun parts and cut out the travel time in between. We could call them, I don't know, stages, or levels, or chapters if you're pretentious. That way there wouldn't be as much useless boring bullshit. Blimey, why has no one thought of this? Unavowed is an urban fantasy game that the Steam user tags seem to think is an RPG, possibly because someone was having a stroke. It's only an RPG in the sense that the game itself is playing the role of a 2D point and click adventure game. Now if you have read a Dresden Files book, then you have my sympathies. Don't give up, there is always help out there. But if you have, then the world of Unavowed will seem very familiar. It doesn't help that Guacamelee seems to think it has a sense of humour, in the same sense that the 7-Eleven seems to think that its coffee is fit for human consumption. It's mainly memes and excruciatingly chummy references to other games, and it's got that Disney Star Wars problem where every dialogue has to end on a gag no matter how dramatic the context, lest anyone think for a nanosecond that we're too weighty and serious to be licensed for Happy Meal toys. So when a nun with a guitar tells us the tragic backstory of the main villain, at the end she has to pick up her guitar again and say, anyway here's Wonderwall. Wait, that's not a gag, that's barely a sentence. Shenmue is a classic game from the Sega Dreamcast that very recently got officially ported to Steam as part of the console world's ever burgeoning acknowledgement of its own irrelevance. The main things I knew about Shenmue is that it's a primogeniture of the particular kind of Japanese open world game now exemplified by the Yakuza series, and when Shenmue 3 got announced all the Sega fans collectively wet their Dr. Robotnik themed pyjama bottoms. So having now played Shenmue 1, I have to come to the conclusion that they were probably doing it ironically, and I hope their mothers appreciated the joke when Laundry Day rolled around. What's that, Yats? Shenmue on the Dreamcast doesn't hold up in this day and age, thanks for the revelation. Don't forget to inform us that Elizabethan roughs make it difficult to look at your smartphone. The plot is, we play Ryo Hazuki, a fairly stock Japanese character, the high school student who is also a karate master and has the emotional range of a plate of egg and chips. Even less, actually, since at least you can use the chips to simulate raised eyebrows, using their quiet stoicism to mask their utter cluelessness. A sneering villain comes to his house, beats him up, kills his dad, steals a green drinks coaster, and so Ryo declares vengeance with the raw emotional power that most of us would use to complain about a vending machine failing to work. It's here in this early phase of the game that we come to fully appreciate Ryo's cluelessness when he falls on roughly 12 occasions for the old, sure I'll tell you what you want to know, just meet me in this dark alley tomorrow with three of my burly mates trick. And the real kick in the teeth was that after several hours of bumming around getting ambushed as punishment for indiscreetly asking random strangers where the sailors hang out, Ryo's mum, or housekeeper, or live-in gimp, or whatever the fuck she is, just goes, oh here's a letter for your dad that's your first actual lead that I forgot about, so everything up to this point has officially been a complete waste of your fucking time, and don't forget to feed the cat. Eventually our detective work takes us to the docks, it never having occurred to Ryo to check there while he was looking for sailors, and we have to get a job moving identical wooden boxes back and forth along the pier over and over again, day in, day out. Finally, the the action's picking up. No really, this is the point when Shenmue turns into a video game, lo and behold. Phew, it only took about six hours. To me, the experience of playing Shenmue 1 was rather like what I imagine having sex with Ryo Hazuki is like. It just lay there, staring resentfully at me as I poked all its bits, trying to provoke a reaction. Yes, I'm sure it was influential and very nostalgic for you, but of all the many wonderful properties in gaming, this is the one you're holding out for a sequel to. That's like having two perfectly good eyeballs and using them to watch Destructoid videos. I go to buy it, it goes, do you want the standard edition for the usual only faintly extortionate 60 bucks or the deluxe? edition for the obviously bullshit 80. You get a whole three more missions. Oh okay, so by deluxe edition what you meant was intact edition. Unbutchered edition. Edition that wasn't picked apart on the surgeon's table by Dr. Nickel and Dr. Dime. You don't get this in films, they don't bring the lights up halfway through and say could the silver ticket holders kindly fuck off for 20 minutes so the gold ticket holders can watch a few subplots. So the base assaults are a miserable chore, frankly. Oh well, at least it's still superhero stealth, at least you're not some boring fuck crouched behind a box throwing distraction objects and getting insta killed the moment you get spotted. Uh, Ahem. <clears throat> I don't like the sound of that cough you just made, Marvel Sony Steve Ditko Spider-Man. Well the thing is, we thought we could have a few missions throughout the campaign where you play as Spider-Man's normal human mates. Crouching behind boxes, throwing distraction objects, and uh, the other thing. You know, for variety. So let me see if I've got this straight, Insomniac Games' Disney Spider-Man. You're going to interrupt your high-octane, big balls, web-swinging, free-roam superhero power fantasy for the sake of some mandatory forced stealth sections playing as a mundane fuck going on a chest-high wall inspection tour. And you're doing this so that we don't get bored. Marvel's Disney's Sony's Insomniac Games' is Stan Lee's Steve Ditko's giant-sized man thing achieves that wonderful quality of Spider-Man 2 in which it was just fun and not a little zen to while away the afternoon randomly swinging through the streets, stumbling on collectibles and little crimes to foil, which may ultimately be enough, but I feel like saying it's a really good game is like saying the Bible supports the ostracization of homosexuals. It's true, but only if you cherry-pick bits of it from the piles and piles of other stuff. She picks up a treasure that sets off the countdown to apocalypse and the bad guys call her a stupid fuck as natural disasters start killing off all the locals and it's completely her fault. But you have to 
have sympathy for her because ages ago her father died and made her quite sad, and alone with nothing to her name but all the money in the universe. Anyway, everyone sort of forgets about that apocalypse thing and the plot becomes about tracking down a lost city of Incas and doubly doubly dumb and at the end we're too late to stop the main bad guy using the ancient magic treasure to turn themselves into a god, the kind of god who walks very slowly around a boss arena and can be killed by shooting them with bullets. Yeah, Laura, I guess it was important we stopped them acquiring this unstoppable power. They might have marched on Washington and been instantly cut down by the National Guard. I'm sure all those dead Mexicans now understand the importance of their sacrifice, you mad cow! Help me out here, viewers. How has Lara Croft's character developed over the course of this developmental origin story? She was already a super gymnast adventurer archery gold medalist when the first game started. She had a brief case of the Wibblies after her first confirmed kill, but she was chalking them up like a champ inside ten minutes. She has received a lot of punishment, but if getting the shit beaten out of you is enough to make you a complex and interesting character, then my knob deserves its own Scorsese-directed biopic. Oh yeah, and there's this business with avenging her father, who was killed by the evil cult conspiracy organisation thing we're up against, but she isn't even sure they did kill him till right at the end, and most of the leaders of the evil cult all die off screen. Which was probably the highlight of the game comedy-wise. There's this action-packed penultimate battle sequence before the final boss where an easily missed voiceover goes, hey I've got all the cult leaders in this helicopter, whoops it crashed and everyone died, butterfingers. Speaking of which, did you see that bit in the trailer where Lara's struggling to squeeze her D-cups through an incredibly narrow underwater cave before she drowns? Effective moment that, wasn't it? Debs clearly thought so, they reuse it like four times. Not that there's any actual peril, it's an altogether now predetermined action set piece, like half the rest of the game. Which is probably why the game world feels so shallow and artificial. There is a modern style oil refinery, literally within a minute's brisk walk of the secret Incan city, for no better reason than to have something Lara can blow up at the start of the final act, which she does within about 30 seconds of arriving at it. What do you expect? She's an outdoors woman, she likes hiking. Insurance rates. Ha 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 One thing I did know about Dragon Quest going in is that Japanese people go double downward dog bonkers for it. Like unofficial public holiday every time one comes out bonkers, putting it in impact terms right up there with terrorist strikes and dead princesses. But having played Dragon Quest XI Echoes of an Elusive Age, and yes I am so going to slowly pervert that subtitle as this review goes on, I am now slightly concerned about the Japanese, as I would about a school friend who confides that they have a crush on the dinner lady, knowing they're going to be driven to suicide by mockery within a week. By me. We break out within minutes and the plot becomes go from city to city looking for the person who isn't one of the five or six endlessly repeated NPC models, recruit them to your party, then do whatever they want to do until the next one comes along. By this method we enlist to our cause a toddler, two hotties, an old man, a comedy stereotype of a homosexual, and an actual homosexual. The funny thing about random battles in Dragon Quest XI Elegies of Eddie the Eagle Edwards is that you only ever get into them because you choose to. Random enemies only notice you if you accidentally stumble up one of their nostrils and you can run faster than them anyway, even during the what I will only call stealth sections if a small dog nervously pissing on a cello is a string quartet. The armed fanatics convinced that you are the spawn of Satan get winded and stop pursuing you after chasing you the approximate length of my dick. Yeah, I get the game's dedicated to the retro nostalgia thing, hence the bleep bloop 8-bit battle sounds, and that's why a lot of the music sounds like it came from a 16-bit era MIDI synthesizer, but it also sounds like someone took that synthesizer, turned to the blarp setting to 100%, and proceeded to stomp on it like a grape in a French vineyard. It's minute-long loop after minute-long loop of string and brass sections honking like pigs queuing up to have their throats cut. Let that be the lesson, viewers. Cozier plays as the past may seem, don't forget it also contains potato famines, Hitler and synth music. Well flip my bollocks up like a Venetian blind and tickle the hairy crevices below if it isn't a prequel to the classic Star Control series of PC Space Explorer maps. Except it isn't really, because according to Wikipedia the original creators aren't behind it and sued for copyright infringement so the developers of Origins couldn't use any of the plot characters or alien races from the old games. Which rather makes me wonder why they were still allowed to call it Star Control, seems like that's a fucking big oversight if you're copywriting things, but then I don't know much about the law. If I did I'd have taken those Google Android motherfuckers to the cleaners years ago. Don't be fooled by the two asses in the name, viewers. Assassin's Creed is half-assed at best. Oh boy, they stamped out a whole new one that's set in ancient Greece, so who gets to be Leonardo da Vinci this time? As in, the historical celebrity who inexplicably becomes BFFs with the main character within seconds of meeting them, and becomes the major support character to lend a sense of desperate authenticity reminiscent of celebrity cameos on more recent episodes of The Simpsons. Oh, we don't do that in every Ass Creed game, yards. It's Herodotus. Thank you! But hey, why bring the hate just because Assassin's Creed is different to how it used to be? Ubisoft wanted to be more of an open world RPG than a sandbox, there's nothing wrong with that. After all, if you want a sandbox, just play literally anything else Ubisoft puts out. Now we're in RPG, we can enjoy the usual benefits of an RPG, that is, a stronger emphasis on story and character development. Can't we, Ubisoft? Look me in the eye, Ubisoft, I said can't we! So what innovation does Assassin's Creed Odyssey bring to the series? Well, there's dialogue trees now. That's the new hotness, is it? Dialogue trees. That's like bursting into the avant-garde fashion show and 
loudly announcing that you've just discovered that oversized t-shirts are good for sleeping in. Do you know how many Assassin's Creed games I've reviewed? One, two, two and a bit, two and a bit more, three, Slack Flag, Yoonshitty, Syndicant, Orim Minge, and Sodacy makes ten. And while I've given each game varying degrees of shit, I've never once failed to play through the entire story campaign until now. In modern gaming, Assassin's Creed is a fat and awkward member of the gang who occasionally made interesting wheezing noises when we punched him in the gut, but it has finally ceased to amuse. I had been playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey for nearly 40 sodding hours, 40 sodding plodding hours, of copy-pasted soldier camps and temples, of hammering away at one overlong health bar after another, like a drinking bird toy trying to eat a king-size Mars bar. And I swear half the characters look the same. I swear King Leonidas and Barnabas the ship captain are the same fucking guy with his beard at different stages of development. And all I could see ahead of me was 40 more hours of the same shit, stretching unbrokenly on from anus to toilet water. You did it, Ubisoft. You beat me. The first Assassin's Creed game I couldn't finish. It can finally take its place alongside everything else I can't finish, like JRPGs, the main courses at American family restaurants, and masturbating to the one nude scene in The Shining. I know Call of Duty and I have had our ups and downs, well, had our downs and downs, and more downs, and just when we thought we couldn't go any further down we broke new ground and discovered a sealed off basement where a family of horny pigs were passing around the corpse of Modern Warfare 1. That was when Codblops 4 laid its knob across my porridge for the first time. No single player campaign. Well, Activision, as Milorad Petrovic said in response to the invasion of Yugoslavia, the fuck? We thought you'd be pleased, Yards. Every story campaign of every COD game you've played in years you call racist and overblown and taken straight from what insecure NRA members see when they close their eyes and touch themselves. At least we didn't hire Kit Harrington this time. Granted. But having removed the single player, are you going to charge less for the game? Oh, <laughs> Yahtzee, I can see why people say you're a funny guy. 130 bucks the deluxe version costs. As the water treatment engineer said of his favourite outflow pipe, that's taking a lot of piss. There are ten playable characters and a little tutorial for each, and they're worth going through just because the person narrating them is the most insecure man in the universe, and for Call of Duty that's saying something. Yeah, press that grenade key. Knock knock, motherfuckers, it's your birthday and the party clown's here. You're a stone-cold brass bald killer and you're gonna have their ass for supper. I'd like to put your penis in my mouth. I mean take you to a steak restaurant and barbecue an entire cow, using nothing but the pressure cooker effect of my giant balls. He's great. It's like listening to Jeremy Clarkson's stream of consciousness while he's using the communal shower at the YMCA. When I joined public matches, I'd do a quick poll of the other players and ask them for one small change they'd suggest to balance the game, and Treyarch will be pleased to know that I now have about 85,000 suggestions for very simple changes, and they might also be interested to hear that they're all a bunch of cucks. However, there is one criticism I can make with complete confidence, and that's that the entire menu interface is complete dog shit. Ah, this is one of those moments that make it all worth it, viewer. One of the three basic pleasures of life. The first wank on a delicate spring morning, finally killing the last witness, and playing a new game that I actually like. Not just like, one that took me completely by surprise and genuinely excited me with an originality and freshness that has long since faded from spring morning wanks. I mentioned in the unavowed review that I appreciate a game that makes me feel clever because god knows precious little does since the stroke, and that's exactly what Obra Dinn does, for you see most people when seconds from death aren't courteous enough to say things like, oh no, I, third officer Eric Braithwaite, am soon to die, but at least I'm in the company of my friends Bob and Hercules, cough, cough, splatter, splatter. So I think we should call these last two weeks something, something like games by auteur developers whose titles I had to double check to make sure I'd written them down properly, Fortnite. Or perhaps we could just call it Not Finished with Red Dead Redemption 2 yet week. Japan has this weird thing, named Swery, sorry couldn't resist. Japan has this weird thing where every imaginable theme and genre of fiction has to be explored through the medium of schoolgirl. Horror, comedy, giant robots, porn, detective drama, bullet hell shooter, porn again, you name it, Japan's got a schoolgirl version. I can't think of any equivalent for this in any other country, it'd be like if every kind of game or TV show made in Canada had a version with Mounties in it. The message of J.J. Macfield and the thing on the doorstep feels confused. Swery lays some cards on the table right at the start with a little opening text saying something like, no one should feel bad for being who they are, I'm Swery and I'm one of the good ones. And that, plus the fact we're searching for our girlfriend, makes me think it's a metaphor for coming to terms with your sexuality. But in that case, what's all the tearing all your arms and legs off business about? Is that a metaphor for scissoring during that time of the m- that was the new worst thing I've ever written. Well, I managed to get through the story of Red Dead Redemption 2 and I have to say I'm quite shook. Possibly the emotional impact, more likely from delirium tremens. Didn't have a single moment to myself. Saturday afternoon I was like, oh boy, I've finally reached the epilogue, maybe I'll actually have Sunday free to relax on. Eight hours of additional story later, fuck me, my definitions are out of date. I had no idea that epilogue now means entire second game. Alright Rockstar, I know your sandbox games tend to have somewhat sprawling plots, but just give us a quick summary of RDR2 and don't be too confusing. Well, RDR2 takes place before RDR1. Oh, you fucked it up already, Rockstar. Two doesn't come before one. Always had a blind spot for numbers, haven't you? That's probably why the ninth GTA game was titled GTA 4. Rockstar sandboxes are somewhat formulaic. You're always a cynical mercenary type who regards everyone he meets with open contempt but always does what they ask him to do anyway, and every single story mission plays like a tutorial for a gameplay mechanic you're never going to use again. The writing's usually what saves it. Dutch's gang consists of about 20 distinct and diverse characters, all of whom you can organically converse with and get to know as at 
the back of your mind you wonder when and how all the ones who didn't appear in RDR1 will inevitably die. Frankly, RDR2's realistic world only impresses me the same way I'd be impressed if you drank a litre of cooking oil, more so by the effort than the wisdom behind it, because so little of what you see and do in RDR2 is actually fulfilling on a story or challenge level. The horse going plop plops sums it all up nicely. I can't envision a scenario in which a lack of horse plops would knock a half star off an otherwise perfect score, but there it is, a drop in an ocean of pointless decadence, and this isn't one line of code, horse underscore plop plops equals one, someone had to texture and animate it and troll sound effect libraries for the ideal plop plop sound, and they could have been using that time to cradle their children or make something creatively fulfilling like Obra Din. The fact that someone had to do it for their job makes me think of a restaurant manager loudly humiliating a waiter because he thinks it'll impress the customer. Well it doesn't, Mr Rockstar, and now I'm going to have to be very cautious about ordering the meatballs. Call of Cthulhu is a game based upon the works of H.P. Lovecraft, America's favourite racist. And alongside the large numbers of horror games inspired by the Cthulhu mythos over the years, Call of Cthulhu can certainly claim the lofty title of another one. I think the moment the game officially lost me was when a giant spindly monster climbed out of a painting for a surprise stealth section in full view with no subtlety or build-up and it might as well have been wearing a top hat. And it wasn't even much of a surprise, because ever since I'd entered the room, Pierce had switched from searching the cupboards I clicked on to wanting to hide inside them, which instantly informed me that either we were about to have a stealth section or Edward's social anxiety problems were kicking in. In the end, the only thing your choices affect are what options are unlocked on the ending Tron 3000, and after going over the guide, what choices unlock what seems to be completely arbitrary. Say yes to character A, drink the whiskey in Act 4 and stick an olive up your nose to unlock ending 1, say no to character A, molest the baby harp seal and put on the kilt instead of the chastity belt to unlock ending 2. Pull your trousers down, select quit to desktop and open your preferred web browser to unlock slightly more fulfilling afternoon! Fallout 76 is a new Fallout game thoughtfully named after its projected average review score. That was the joke I was gonna go with, on the assumption that it would be the usual Bethesda fare, nice looking but bland and inexplicably popular like most American television presenters, but goodness gracious Fallout 76 had taken a drubbing in the user reviews, the Metacritic page has produced more red circles than the average venereal infection. Don't tell me that those dastardly unpleasable fanboys who ruined Diablo Immortal's big day in the spotlight have struck again. How dare those horrible nerds make such spoiled entitled demands for reasonably priced franchise installments targeted at the people who made that franchise popular in the first place, it's just bull bullying, really, isn't it? If only these dissatisfied consumers with very little actual power and influence would stop bullying the poor, innocent, massively wealthy corporations and leave them in peace to hack out inferior garbage designed to siphon money from idiots and exploit what positive emotions remain unstrangled out of existence. Yeah, push that narrative, games industry, it worked for the Ghostbusters reboot. The story is, you were in a nuclear bunker and got let out to the post-apocalyptic wasteland, blah blah blah, but the bunker was entirely on the level, wasn't subjecting its residents to weird experiments, and the overseer seemed to be a perfectly reasonable human being, which made me wonder if the story writer had ever fucking played a Fallout game before. The game has no human NPCs, a fact that the marketing blurb is weirdly keen to point out. Hey, look at all this work we didn't do. Which if your browsing history is anything like mine, well first of all delete your history you sick bastard, and you've no doubt been seeing that live action Fallout 76 advert with tiresome frequency. It's been constantly popping up like a nervous orgy host as that one. It depicts achingly diverse groups of players having communal wasteland fun times with the tone of an online dating advert, dishonestly depicting smartly dressed attractive people meeting in romantic locations with neither party trying to eat the other one's skin. Yeah, that wasn't representative of my experience, when at any time there'd be like ten players scattered across the entire map. I only interacted with someone once, when I was curious to know what was making the sound of a baby crying and a couple having an argument. People ask me if I worry about the future of the interactive arts in this era of AAA being a constant stream of soulless exploitative knockoffs, but I'm not worried because we've been here before. At the end of the 90s, games like Quake 3 and Unreal Tournament tried to convince us that we didn't really want artistic single player PC games when we could just pay to run on hamster wheels all day. And look what the 2000s brought us. Deus Ex, Thief 2, Bioshock, Portal, it's always a phase. In the long run, the only eternal guarantor of success is a quality product well made, ideally with tits on the front. The money to be made from knocking off what's popular and exploiting the stupid always dries up eventually, if only because the stupids die out from daring each other to headbutt the ceiling fan. Reviewing Battlefield 5 hardly seems fair when I blew off Call of Duty World War 2. Going back to tired old World War 2 after having innovatively explored new settings in Modern Warfare and Black Ops was just pathetic, frankly, and Battlefield instantly following suit like a puppy starved of cuddles and bonios is new levels of pathetic. This is no one showed up to my Babylon 5 themed birthday party territory, so bollocks to it, I played Hitman 2 instead this week. Not the first Hitman 2, the other Hitman 2. What I will say about Hitman 2 specifically is that I get a strong sense that the series is blatantly repeating itself. This feeling came on after I got to the mission titled Another Life, set in an American suburb, which for some reason reminded me of a mission from Hitman Blood Money set in an American suburb that was titled A New Life. How embarrassing for you, IO Interactive. Or it would be if being a AAA developer these days didn't mandate having your shame glands surgically removed. Killer7 is one of those games that I love but I'm not sure I'd recommend. Take the 
the sort of usual baseline level of weirdness all Japanese games have, by virtue of being from a different culture that's been nuked more than the recommended healthy number of times, then add a sort of anarchic post-punk stream of consciousness where even the art style changes from chapter to chapter, and then cut the budget a few times so the developers have to drop every scene that explained what the fuck was going on. But even without understanding what the fuck was going on, there's still enough humanity in the main characters that you feel something for them by the end of their journey, especially the Mexican wrestler who headbutts bullets out of the air. What I felt for him was a strong desire to invite him to my next birthday party. There's a scene in a burning room right before a boss fight where the boss is saying something and you'd assume anything a boss tells you in a burning room right before they die has got to be important. But you can't make out what the fuck she's saying over the ambient fire noises. Ah, maybe that's the point, Yards. Like that bit in Evangelion where they deliberately mute the dialogue just as Specky McCunflap says something important. Maybe it's intended as an analogy for modern times in which important information is drowned out by sensationalist media. Ugh, don't start down that rabbit hole. Maybe me kicking you in the bollocks is a metaphor for the neoconservative urban renewal policy. We return once again to THQ's ongoing reinterpretation of Judeo Christian mythology as dramatised with poorly painted Warhammer 40k miniatures. After Darksiders 1 and 2, a lot of questions still remain surrounding the ongoing story, chief among them being how the fuck do you expect me to remember this plot? The first game was eight years ago, I can barely remember what I was doing last night, or why I woke up this morning in a half empty vat of Frangelico. Also, I already said Fury's supermarket owned brand Estes flasks refill after she dies and respawns at a checkpoint, but they don't refill if you merely stop at a checkpoint. So when you find the checkpoint after an arduous journey, you'd be well advised to find the nearby enemy and let them kill you so you can be back at full healing capacity before pressing on. And the legendary apocalyptic warrior Fury happily bending over so a standard ground link and practice broken twig gynaecology isn't terribly immersive. Well, it is for the broken twig, but not in the right way. Ow. Still, I find Fury to be the least boring and contemptible of the three Darksiders protagonists thus far. At least her character undergoes growth, so I'm told anyway. Could have sworn she didn't. She starts the game angrily mowing through gremlins and ends the game angrily mowing through gremlins, but near the end her support character says, Mistress, you've changed, and who am I to fucking argue with that? There's this bit in the intro where Fury's checking in on an imprisoned war, and they say he's been put in the timeout chair for breaking the seventh seal without approval from upper management, and something about that niggled me in the back of my mind, so I looked up the plot summary for Darksiders 1 and my suspicion was confirmed. War didn't break the seventh seal. If anything, he was being punished for not breaking it before setting off for the apocalypse. He breaks it at the end of Darksiders 1, but that takes place long after this. Yeah, so commiserations if you are trying to follow the ongoing story of Darksiders, cause the fucking writers aren't! And my first thought when I saw Just Cause 4 being announced was, why? Surely the character arc of agitator liberator Rico Rodriguez reached a natural conclusion in the last game when he agi liberated his own home country. And there isn't much more that can be done in terms of spectacle. I've already seen what happens when an unstable foreign country builds all its fuel depots out of cardboard and oily rags. Silly me, I should have realised. It's a franchise still with name recognition and goodwill, so obviously our corporate masters have to ruin it as part of the ongoing process of crushing our spirits and preparing us for the brain drills. Yes, it's mildly amusing to attach a balloon to a cow, watch it fly into the air, then pop the balloon and watch the cow slam face first into a meadow as you crow, now that's what I call grass-fed beef, but none of it's any use for beating the game's challenges, and having you beat challenges to unlock it all feels like a misguided attempt to combine two audiences that want two different things, like tattooing gay porn onto a vagina. I think they were planning to have a final boss fight, right at the end the main bad guy activates his ultimate doomsday weapon while fleeing and goes, haha, now you all will die, and Rico jumps onto the doomsday weapon, and I think at that point you were supposed to have a final boss fight with it, but I guess the office party clown's shift was almost over and they had to quickly tie things up. So instead, still in the same cutscene, Rico just goes, here's an idea, why don't we not get killed by the doomsday weapon? And so they don't. End of game. Grrr, curse you, Rico Rodriguez, cries the main villain. I am defeated once and for all. Somehow. Another year of gaming spreads out behind us like a particularly explosive trouser accident and so it once again falls to me to nominate the games that were best, the games that were worst, and the games that fell asleep after one thrust and left me to wander an unfamiliar neighbourhood without even money for an uber. And oh what an embarrassing oversight, I seem to have run out of weeks in the year before I could get around to Smash Brothers Ultimate. Oh well, if it makes you feel better I wouldn't have put it in any of my top fives, unless I came up with another new one, like top five games for simultaneously giving yourself epilepsy and carpal tunnel syndrome. Oh that Yahtzee Croshaw, I hear them say, he's that old fogey who just alternates between pissing on every new AAA game and sucking indie dick. Not so, detractors. I'll have you know there's piss enough in my balls for every class of game. Hence my fifth, blandest game being indie Kickstarter excretion Moonlighter. Just for being a painfully generic pixel art dungeon crawler whose one unique gameplay idea had all the depth of a Netflix true crime documentary. Well, let's get the obvious one out of the way quickly, and if every year passes that a new David Cage game doesn't get onto my shit list, then load the family dog with drinking water and canned goods, cause civilization is officially over. Detroit Comestay. A hack writer who has convinced themselves and others that they're some kind of bold game narrative auteur is bad enough, but when they think they're being profound, it's a McChicken bad witch with a cocklet milkshake. Now as any parent of young children will tell you, it's nice when they play together, but forcing them to do so is a highway to screams, resentment and sky dancers in the eye socket. It's a particularly bad idea to force us to play together to experience your mediocre string of sub-David Cage slow time events and movie cliches a way out. Oh Christ, sub-David Cage, that's a new low isn't it? That's a limbo dancing contest at the geothermal power plant low. But 
But I digress. Blimey, that dude had a big nose. While I refute the accusation of being an indie knob gobbler, it is true that I try to limit AAA presence in my top five because they can get perfectly good hand jobs from literally anywhere else. But lest I be accused of pretentiousness, yeah, Marvel Spider Man was a good game with a stimulating core gameplay loop, and in contrast to the other really big releases like Red Dead Redemption 2, exhibited a considerably more restrained use of horses' buttholes. Ubisoft sandboxes most definitely have a permanent booking at the Blandford Heights Hotel, but I think Assassin's Creed Odyssey deserves particular mention for being the Assassin's Creed game that finally made me bored of the whole sordid business. Assassin's Creed 3 didn't do that with its pulse pounding document signing action, but Odyssey did it by forcing me to spend an hour chipping away at a minotaur with a sword that I wasn't convinced hadn't been replaced with a sword shaped novelty bath sponge. It may interest you to know that all three of my lists this year feature a survival game, and furthermore, the worst game lists entry isn't Fallout 76. For all its greedy corporate buggery, misuse of beloved established IP, and being just plain boring and shitty to play after all that, there was another game that beat it on all three of those fronts. Look no further than Metal Gear Survive. You can't look any further anyway, because you'll be too busy wincing and tearing up. Well, my 2018 Game of the Year should come as no surprise, since I've recommended it to every person, dog, and houseplant I've conversed with since it came out. Lucas Pope's Return of the Obra Dinn is the kind of thing that restores a man's faith in artistic game design by using an original and engaging core mechanic to tell a story in an utterly unique way. Also, if for whatever reason you need samples of death rattles from brawny European sailors, you won't find a better source, you weirdo. But for the year's blandest, we return to the world of survival games, as well as the world of full frontal nudity. And it doesn't get much blander than the game that would have me grind up 200 rocks to build a fucking rabbit hutch, Conan Exiles. Not even titties could liven this one up, mainly because playing colon textiles for the nudity would have been like tying a bungee cord to yourself and trying to use a fleshlight at the far end of a very long corridor. The worst game of 2018 was, like the devil and weird sex practices, known by many names. The seven hour snore, hunt down the refund, shit down the piss shit, call it whatever you like, just never forget what hunt down the freeman was and what it represented. A cringe fest that unstitched its thoughtless patchwork of stolen assets to whip out its diseased knob and dispense blood flecked urine all over a once top rate franchise with the tacit approval of its creator. Fuck, man, what else is there to say? I suppose I could say fuck again. No, that's the wrong attitude. It's a new year after all. Let's move on from the past and focus on what the future will bring. Fuck!